I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. Uh, mo uh, we're going to go to approval of the closed session agenda. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Mr. The, Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion. Please vote. Did it come up? So what do we do? Hit what is that? F5. I'm going to put a little sticker there that says refresh. No, none of us voted. Deb, it didn't show up for all, any of us. The vote is five yes, three absent. Motion passed. Moving on to the motion to enter closed session. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move action that pursuant to Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711 that this school board enter closed session for the following reasons. One, to discuss, consider the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and resignation of specific employees, appointees, or officers of our school board under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 1, and 8. Two, to discuss with legal counsel and take action on the placement of appeals to specific students under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 2, and 8. Three, to consult with legal counsel regarding a specific legal matter and probable litigation under Virginia Code sections 2.2-3711A, 1, 7, and 8. And four, to discuss the performance and evaluation of the division superintendent and set mutually agreed upon goals for the 1920 school year as provided in regulation to 11-1B evaluation of the superintendent under Virginia code sections 2.2-3711A and 1. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman, I Ms. second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Discussion? Please vote. Vote is five yes, three absent, motion passed. The uh, Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session and return to open session in approximately one hour. Thank you. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed, or I'm sorry, Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session from closed session. Um, we will reconvene and we do not have any closed session action items, is that correct? Correct. So we will move then to the adoption of the closed session consent agenda 8.01. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ralston. I second. Um, discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Moving on to the closed session certification of motions in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move action that pursuant to Virginia Code sections 2.2-3712 to the closed session of our school board meeting of September 18, 2019 be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies to the best of each member's knowledge one only public business matter is lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies and two, only such public business matters were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Uh, do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Jesse. I second. Any discussion? Please vote. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. In response to community requests for positive, um, uh, hear many good things about what's happening in our school division, we'll continue to kick off our meetings this school year with the Positively PWCS presentation. Tonight's Positively PWCS presentation spotlights and recognizes the many people who work diligently to prepare our schools for opening. Superintendent Dr. Waltz will introduce our presentation. 
Thank you, Chairman Lateef, members of the board. We are very proud of the improvement displayed by our English learners on the standards of learning. Occoquan Elementary School posted the most significant gains, and Principal Buddy Lint is here this evening with some folks from Occoquan to tell you more. Mr. Lint. Good evening, Chairman Latif, members of the school board, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Buddy Lent. I am the proud principal of Occoquan Elementary School. I see myself and many of the children here at Occoquan, and I would have fit in very well at a school like this because our student, students make it extremely cool to work hard and show just how very smart they are each and every day. It is a goal of each and every single student to feel like they can be successful without judgments and to take educational risks without question. On July 2017, I was able to inherit a school that was the perfect fit to my unique personality. It is a high energy school with extremely high expectations. This isn't something new for Occoquan. The school of Occoquan has a rich history of having some excellent administrators at the helm. Some of these leaders may sound familiar to you even after the 92 years of Occoquan's existence. Names such as Elizabeth Vaughn, Herbert Saunders, Todd Erickson, and the person that I replaced, Hamish Brewer. Together, my staff, students, and parents come to school on fire with excitement each and every day, ready for high quality instruction. Our students work hard with grit and determination on a daily basis. Many times, they stay after school during the week and on Saturdays to extend their teaching and learning. If I could paint a picture of Occoquan, it would look like a Jackson Pollock. We have students that are very different in race, culture, and ethnicity. Currently, 49% of our students are Hispanic. Our second largest demographic is our African-American population, uh, which is, that makes up 20% of our school. 52% of our students are EL students that speak and are exposed to over 25 different languages. So as you can see, our EL students are very prevalent in our school which means our instruction needs to be very targeted for our unique learners. In addition to academic language needs, over 64% of our population is economically disadvantaged. However, regardless of our students' languages, economics, or what zip code they live in, we know how to reach and teach each and every single one of them. Even though we are a nationally distinguished Title I school, we have areas in which we could improve. Overall, we have had very strong scores. However, some of the biggest gains in our SOL results were accomplished with our ELL students. Impressively, the EL students that are still in the process of learning the language, such as our levels ones through fours, made some of the most significant double-digit increases in science. In science at Occoquan, we created a huge interactive science night that was led by our new science lead, Ms. Watkins, last school year. <clears throat> At science night, the students presented their science projects. Then the students and parents got to go from station to station to conduct different experiments with each, with each other to take, take them home. We have also increased the vocabulary exposure through announcements as well as exposing them to more science standards through language arts and math lessons. In math, our EL students reached an incredible pass rate of 91%. Just our ELs reached 91%. Much of this is due to our after-school programs that we incorporate math in multiple ways for our students to be able to apply to many different scenarios. The staff at the O has an all-in mentality. You have heard my version of the Occoquan story. Now let's hear from our four electri electrifying tribal leaders, Anaya Archipong, the tribal leader for Altarista. Go ahead and stand up. Miranda Quintanero, the tribal leader for Mapongo. Diego Concho, the tribal leader for Sego Se. And Faith Sovula, the tribal leader of Leotad. I'll now turn it over to Anaya. Good evening. My 
Good evening. My name is Anaya Achenpong, and I am a tribe leader for Altruista, which, which stands for unselfishness. I would like to talk to you tonight about what some of the learning experiences are like at the O. We have done a couple of new things in our school and library. We have this new area called the Makerspace, which is an area where we can be creative in our own way. We get to do science experiments, and we have thinking robots that we get to explore. It's very fun because every time you go into the library, the students are happy because it makes the library more fun and the students are excited to go to Encore. Also, the teachers have been more fun, like my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Matarko. Now Mrs. Corona did a cafe recreation. She had us work on our decimal skills by ordering off a menu while we added, subtracted, and compared the numbers with decimals. That was fun and delicious. All of my teachers make learning fun. Every day at Aquaquan is a learning experience for all students. Trust me, there is never a dull moment. Good evening, my name is Miranda Quintero and I am a tribal leader for Mapango, which stands for initiative. I would like to talk to you tonight about why Aquaquan is so unique. From my perspective, Aquaquan is unique because they give you the opportunity to use the knowledge they have given you and try it on your own. It is a place for you, you can be successful, but also a place where you can make errors. The teachers will provide you with many learning opportunities to be successful. The teachers give you the tools and strategy to stand up by yourself and be unique the way you are without judgment. Many students at the O come from many different places. There is not one place that is a majority at Aquaquan. They teach us how to embrace our home culture and combine it with our school culture. Aquaquan is unique in their own way and they're not afraid to show it. Whenever, whenever it, if be someone were in, in a costume exciting the students or someone teaching you both P, music and PE at that exact same time, Aquaquan is like no other place I have experienced. Our teachers and our principals help us do the right thing even where it's, where, when no one is looking. This is why Aquaquan is special to me. Good evening, my name is Diego Concho, and I am a tribal leader for Sego Se, which stands for integrity. I would like to talk to you tonight about our fabulous celebrations at the O. When I first came to Aquaquan, I thought it was just a regular old school, but then I quickly realized it's not a, just a regular old school. It's so different that I wondered why my old school did not do the things we do at Aquaquan. What makes Aquaquan special is our tribal system. The four tribes, Sego Se, which stands for integrity, Altruista, which stands for unselfishness, Leotard, which stands for lo loyalty, and Pongo, which stands for initiative, make the school special for not just the students, but our parents and the community members that are also in the tribes at, at the school. The celebrations, the celebrations are just great. The lights and the music are fantastic, but I really love the way the staff get up there with the students on an equal level to celebrate with us. Aquacon is not just a school that has a bunch of rules. It shows how good behavior is one of the most important things in life. I really like the tribes. Even though I am Sego Se, we are, we are all still four tribes, one village. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Faith Savula, and I am a tribal leader for Leotod, the only two-time champions. <laughs> I would like to talk to you tonight about our fantastic teachers and the 30 essentials we all live by. I want to start off by saying Akukwan is very special, and what makes it special is the teachers. The teachers provide you with so many things in such a fun way I have never learned or had an opportunity to learn in such a fun way at my old school. Usually students say, my teacher pushed me to be the best and pe people just believe you, but it's different at Akakwan. The teachers at Akakwan do not produce robots like they do at other schools, but they encourage us to be the individuals and think and work for ourselves, even if that might be in a different technique, a different language, or something else, they will always help us to be the best we can. At Akakwan, the teachers don't just teach us the information, but they teach us about things that will help us later in life. Last thing I will talk about is the 30 essentials. 
the 30 essentials are rules you must follow, but you're not following them. They follow you. And the main essential is the one that drives them all, is we are a family. Whether you're a parent, student, or staff, we are a family no matter what. We have these essentials plastered all over the walls in the building. We are always, as the teachers and principals, holding each other to these essentials to make ourselves the best citizens that we can be. Like Diego said earlier, what we close our assemblies with is four tribes in one village. Thank you. Thank you to all the tribal leaders that were able to make it here tonight. They did a wonderful job. Um, now, we are going to play a short video showing some of our wonderful students and staff that are in action. On behalf of the entire Occoquan community, I would like to thank you all for your dedication and support with not only our EL students, but with our entire student population here at the O. Thank you, and I hope you have a great night. I would like to call this meeting of the Prince William County. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Jessie. Sorry. Thank you, Occoquan, you rock. I, I, you know, I, last week I think I went to several schools and, and I try not to come on the first day having been a principal, I try not to do that. But I also said that I would just drop by so you were in a code of behavior. And I was amazed at the different murals on the wall, your sense of family and how these kids, uh, I saw your scores, all the tribal scores, and if you go to Occoquan, they have a huge trophy, and these kids know exactly where they are. They monitor. Uh, everything in that building is monitored, and I, you just fit as a principal in that school. It's like you've been there forever. You've taken a school that was high-performing, maintained that, and put your own touch on it. So I just want to congratulate you and congratulate the students at Occoquan because these are kids, you know, when we, uh, some of us have been blessed to see kids that in these zip codes that we say not, are not supposed to learn, not only learn, but they learn at high levels. And I know Dr. Walsh is smiling because that's who we are. And learning at high levels, not just high levels, but higher than some students in other schools. So I just want to congratulate you and thank you for sharing uh, everything. And where's Patty Ferrara? Patty, please stand. Patty and I worked together at Neabsco. Patty was supposed to retire 10 years ago. And Patty made the mistake of going to Occoquan. And she told me she was going to retire, and she just can't because there's such, you have, you're, there's such a love affair in that building with you and what you're doing. So thank you, thank you. I appreciate everything that you've done for it the school and for the families. Thank you. And boys and girls, you were excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. I would like to call this meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. Um, there will be a moment of silence at the request of Mr. Trenum, the Brentsville District. Now.
Okay, thank you. Um, next, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. If the students want to come up, and they can lead us in the pledge right at the podium again. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we will be moving on to the approval of the public meeting agenda. A motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting agenda as recommended. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Discussion? Please vote. Vote is eight yes, unanimous, motion passed. Moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda, a motion is in order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Will. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public meeting consent agenda as recommended. Do you have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Uh, Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the, there are lots, lots of great items tonight in consent agenda. I encourage you to go through and take a look at the different um, resolutions we have. Bullying Prevention Month, Dyslexia Awareness, um, National Physical Therapy Awareness. We have a lot of good things listed. But one that I added is for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And I'm thrilled for the board to have this um, to support tonight on the consent agenda. And I'm just going to read one section of it. Um, it talks about organizations, nonprofit organizations across the U.S., such as Alex's Army Childhood Cancer Foundation and Trevor's Treasures, based right here in Prince William County, are working diligently to raise awareness for childhood cancers and to provide support for families whose lives are forever changed by a childhood cancer diagnosis. And the reason they're working so hard for families is because they also have been forever changed by childhood cancer. And so in memory of our former students um, that I knew, Alex, or knew or know their families, Alex, Parker, and Tony, and for all of our families who fought and continue to fight, you have our respect and support. And um, can I just take a little moment of prerogative here? Um, any of you who are here tonight and supported the Childhood Cancer Awareness Resolution, could you raise your hands or stand, please? Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Ms. Satterwhite. Uh, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I do every year, I just would like to um, give a shout out to our custodial staff. Uh, we don't talk about them enough, but without them, we wouldn't be here operating as normal. Um, I just think that they're one of our uh, least recognized groups of individuals that keep the system going. So I just wanted to personally say thank you for all that you do. And it's very much appreciated. Without you, we wouldn't have uh, meetings running smoothly, clean facilities and everything else that goes along with all the job duties that you do that are unseen often or unnoticed by most of us. But uh, I do appreciate it, and I know our teachers and our students do too. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Jesse? Uh, I also wanted to um, acknowledge the custodial staff. I haven't been a principal and knowing uh, how important the custodians are and the type of work. I, I was in another school system and I walked into the bathroom and, I, and right away, Dr. Waltz, I said, this is not Prince William. <laughs> this is not Prince William and everything here is just sparkling clean. I also wanted to give a shout out to the bus drivers because they have survived the first two or three weeks of school. Uh, and they have survived not just kindergartners, but they have three-year-olds now on the bus and I'm on that uh, policy council for Head Start, and I know that's really a task. So I just wanted to shout out to those two groups of people. Thank you. Excellent, please vote. Uh, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to recognize, um, we've got a very long list of items here, but we have a uh, bullying prevention month, uh, item 14.06, uh, and it's, uh, in conjunction with the Virginia School Board Association, uh, recognizing this month as a month to uh, speak out against bullying. Um, and so 
um, at all levels. Um, I think this is an important resolution. Uh, and so uh, very happy about this. There's numerous other uh, resolutions um, honoring uh, and remembering uh, numerous very important um, groups of people. Uh, there's one other that's a little near and dear to my heart. That's German American Day on October 6th. So everybody should uh, celebrate it well. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch, with that very good German last name, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Please vote, everyone. The vote is eight yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Excellent. Moving on to citizen comments on the agenda and non-agenda items. It looks like we have seven speakers um, tonight. People signed up to speak, so everyone that signed up will have a chance to speak, and um, we will, um, I'll announce your names and you can come up here. You'll have three minutes to speak and the clerk will keep time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. Yellow light will signify you could sum up your position. Red indicates your time is up and you should stop. Please use, use proper decorum and manners while at the podium. If you do not do so, you will be asked to step aside. Please give your name and address for the record when you approach the podium. Um, and you guys can call, come up if you wish. Karen Boyd, Jenny Green, Christy Barkalo, Melissa Alexander, Swanell Wiggins, R.M. Jesse, and Shannon Nuzum. So the first speaker will be Miss Karen Boyd. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. My name is Karen Boyd, and I live in the Occoquan District, and my address is on file. I'm here because September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm speaking to you tonight as the parent of a child who had cancer. When I became a mom, my greatest fear was that illness or injury would take that which is most precious to me, my children but I allowed myself to believe that tragedy would never strike my family. One afternoon, I found myself in a small room at an Nova Fairfax hospital with a doctor my husband and I had just met that afternoon, and she was using my son's name and the word tumor in the same sentence. And still, I held on to the belief that my child would beat the odds and that my greatest fear would not be realized. My son Parker fought with all that he had in his tiny body and then we pushed him to fight harder. Despite every effort, we, like too many other families, were faced with the unthinkable. And I have had to learn to live in a reality where my fear is how we live. This past Sunday, Parker would have turned 21. As we have for the past 12 years, we celebrated his birthday for him rather than with him. Parker passed away when he was only nine. He was smart and funny and he loved to dance, but he was also an envelope pusher and he could spot a loophole or a shortcut a mile away, which often got him into trouble. His first grade teacher could tell you some stories. But cancer struck when he was only seven and the last 20 months of his life were spent stuck at home or in the hospital, fighting with courage and determination I will never know. My greatest fear for Parker now is that because he died so young and that because time passes without him, he'll be forgotten. September's Child Cancer Awareness Month and Gold Ribbons, honoring and remembering children who have battled cancer can be seen prominently more this month than any other time of the year. My husband and I will be attending DC's Cure Fest this Sunday where Parker's picture will be on a wall with hundreds of other pictures of children who have fought the same battle. So I'm here to thank Mrs. Satterwhite for putting this resolution on tonight's consent agenda to recognize September's Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you for recognizing the children who have had to find superhero strength to fight, unthi to fight unthinkable odds and for those who are still fighting today. Thank you for honoring the children who have lost their battles to cancer. And thank you for the part you're doing in ensuring that Parker and all the children like Parker will never be forgotten. Uh, Jenny Green. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Jenny Green. I am the co-founder for Alex's Army Childhood Cancer Foundation in Haymarket. I'm also the mom of three beautiful children, Caitlin, who's a kindergartner at Gravely Elementary, Jacob, who is a student at Reagan Middle School, and Alex, who attended both Gra Gravely and Bull Run Middle School. I want to thank each of you on the board for approving this resolution tonight, and especially Allison Satterwhite, who has embraced our foundation and our efforts over the last several years. My oldest son, Alex, was diagnosed with Wilms tumor when he was one month into kindergarten. Throughout his treatment, Alex had over 17 surgeries. He endured countless rounds of chemotherapy, radiation, cryoablation, and experimental treatments. The treatments he endured at various points left him without hair and often with weakened immune system, and on two separate occasions left him um, paralyzed, one from the waist down and one in his right hand. Alex's story is just one story from the over 15,000 children who are diagnosed with cancer every year. Childhood cancer is not as rare as we would like to think, and as you know today in many of our Prince William schools, um, there are children and teens who have fought or who are fighting today. A childhood cancer diagnosis doesn't just impact the child fighting. It forever changes the course of a family's life. It impacts brothers and sisters, classmates, friends, teachers, and entire communities. At our elementary school, there are two buddy benches on the outskirts of the playground. One bench sits under a tree and is in memory of Ellie Howdershell, a sweet little girl in our community who loved pink, loved reading, and loved her family, but who passed away from a brain tumor at the age of 11. The second bench sits perfectly on the side of the basketball court and is in memory of Alex, who loved sports, his family, friends, and church, and who passed away in 2016, just the end, before the end of his sixth grade year. Despite what we have been through, our family feels so blessed because of all who came alongside us. The staff and students at each of Alex's schools supported him through his fight. They loved and embraced our family, and they did everything they could to show Alex and his siblings that they had an army behind them every step of the way. Alex's nurse and principal from um, his elementary school are here tonight. With that said, I know that from speaking with other families that not all receive the same level of support. Awareness is vital as it helps build understanding, acceptance, and compassion amongst students, teachers, and communities. It also leads to increased research funding, which we pray will soon lead to cures. I am so thankful for this board's decision this evening to recognize September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in our schools. Thank you for your vote today and your support going forward. This resolution will make a difference for all whose lives are forever changed by childhood cancer. Christy Barcolo. Hi, my name is Christy, and uh, my address is on file. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about my daughter, Molly. I like to think Molly is a typical Prince William County student. She went to Bella Elementary from kindergarten to first, fifth grade and Grand Park Middle School from sixth to eighth grade. At the end of eighth grade, she started having odd pains. Um, took her from doctor to doctor to doctor for two months. Uh, she was told that she was being a dramatic teenager. There was nothing wrong. I was told I was being a crazy mom. Um, finally, she was put in the hospital. And at the end of eight days, we were told the news. Molly had cancer. The next morning, she was, had a surgery. Uh, they surgically put a port into her chest, and she had chemo that very day. 10 days later, she was finally sent home from the hospital, only to be called back because Molly was diagnosed with an extremely rare uh, type of cancer called hypodiploid ALL. Her only chance of survival was a bone marrow transplant. For the next five months, Molly endured weekly chemotherapy. She had a spinal tap every week, a bone marrow biopsy every other week. She had 29 blood transfusions, eight rounds of full body radiation. During this time, she tried to do her schoolwork. She would lay on the sofa and put the laptop on the floor because she was so nauseous when she sat up, of course she would throw up. So she would work really hard on her schoolwork just laying on the floor. Um, unfortunately, the day her grades arrived, she was devastated. You can see she was a straight A student in eighth grade. 
At the end of eighth grade, she had all A's and took three high school classes. Her first report card came. She had straight F's and U's in effort and conduct. She said to me, Mom, does the school think I'm going to die? Is that why they don't care? We had to march forward. We just kept moving ahead. She went into the hospital for 42 days in the month of December, yes, over Christmas, where she had her bone marrow transplant. At one point, she had 12 lines going into her body. She had morphine constantly going throughout her body. When we got home from 42 days in the hospital, we were told she was kicked out of the program. She was no longer in school. She, I said, Mom, let's give up. Don't worry about school. She said, no, I want to catch up. So I got on the phone, made lots of phone calls, emails, with the help of uh, former Deputy Superintendent Ray Darlington and the late Dr. Renee Lacey, I got her back in school. And I agreed to pay for summer school so that she could finish and graduate on time with her class. And she was part of the first graduating class of Colgan High School. And is now a sophomore at Christopher Newport University, majoring in biology and on the dean's list. Thank you. Melissa Alexander. Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Melissa Alexander. I live in Manassas, Virginia, and my address is on file. And I am an English teacher at Patriot High School. I'm proud to serve as a PWCS employee, but my most important job is mommy to Julia a feisty eighth grader at Marstella Middle School and almost five-year survivor of brain cancer. In 2014, after six weeks of chronic arm and head pain and numerous in incorrect diagnoses, our sweet girl was diagnosed with a grade two ependymoma brain tumor that was almost 10 centimeters, about the size of a grapefruit. She was immediately admitted to the Nova Children's PICU and our lives changed forever. After two years of intense treatment, three major brain surgeries, five minor surgeries, eight rounds of chemo, and two months of radiation, we are so grateful that Julia's tumor remains stable. We are indeed blessed. Today, she is a bright, funny, uh, spirited, bright, funny teenager who loves to write stories, play piano, sing, and watch movies. And one, of, one would think she is completely healthy. But the fact is, Julie is not in remission and never will be. Over five centimeters of her tumor is inoperable. She lives every day with this large mass in her brain. And yes, she can run, jump, play, seemingly like other kids. But Julie has to under, o overcome insurmountable op obstacles to live a normal life. Like over two-thirds of childhood cancer survivors, the harsh cancer treatment caused so much harm to her little body and many long-term effects that complicate all parts of her life, especially in school. Just yesterday, Julia wrote a heartbreaking observation in her creative writing journal. She said, it's not fair that nobody understands that once you get out of the hospital, you have a new battle, feeling like a stranger in a world of nightmares we call school. In my interactions with other pediatric cancer families, this sentiment is, a co is common among survivors. That's why I was so excited and so grateful about this resolution to honor Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in all PWCS schools. My hope is that with more knowledge and understanding, our faculty, staff, and administrators can better serve children with cancer both during treatment and in survival. With all <clears throat> they've been through, our sweet babies more than deserve the best chance to survive and thrive. Thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you for your time. And especially thank you for speaking up for kids with cancer. God bless you and go gold. Swanell Wiggins. Okay. Um, Mr. Jesse. Good evening, board members. My name is Richard Jesse. My address is on file. I just want to talk a little bit, subject I've mentioned several times, boundaries and boundary hearings and, and planning. I would still encourage the board to consider working uh, together to come up with a better method and system of determining boundaries and stuff that, that we have. i also like to say uh, that I asked the question of Dr. Waltz, perhaps someone, uh, how many people does it take 
to come up with you to decide that you need to do positively PL, uh, PL, PWC. The reason I ask that because I would like to know how many people it will take to come up with doing something to highlight what needs to be fixed in the system and talking about the fixes in the system. We talk about all the good things in the system, which is fine, I love that. But we do not discuss what needs to be fixed in the system. And there are things, these parents just now were talking about things that happened to their kids in the school system that should not have happened. So we need to address some of that. The other thing I'd like to say is there is something happening with the athletic program at Woodbridge High School. It seems to me that you have a football coach that has a reputation for having the most scholarships, the most people going to, to Division I schools in the country or in the state, and you have a school that it appears that there is some retaliation going on. And I'd like to have Dr. Waltz, you, you look into it. You have a school like Freedom High School that has convicted felons that are coaches. You guys know that, and you allow them to be on the, on the coaching, but you have a coaching system at Woodbridge High School that's one of the best in the country, and they are doing a lot of things, but there are, in my opinion, retaliation. Thank you. Shannon Newsom. And I apologize if I said that wrong. It's Newsom, that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having us here tonight. Um, I, as well as the other parents, are here in support of Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. This is my daughter, Sydney. She's a junior at Colgan High School. Um, August 14th, 2007, um, you know, we had everything going for us and then we got the news of our son Trevor um, was diagnosed with stage 4 high-risk neuroblastoma um, he was given about a 5% chance to make it five years and um, he fought hard and it was a six-year battle he was three days short of six years so he proved them wrong with that 5% and he, he was a fighter and um, while he was in the hospital um, in the very beginning I will share with you, one of, our, one of our first conversations was with Mr. Boyd, because Mr. Boyd was Trevor's principal. He was two weeks shy of starting kindergarten, Trevor was. So Mr. Boyd, who was currently battling uh, cancer as well with Parker, um, called me, and it was, you know, he, he, he did wonders for Trevor. Trevor and Parker were friends. Um, you know, Trevor was able to go to school when he could, um, when he wasn't in the hospital, and he was able to experience those elementary school years um, thanks to the hard work of you know everybody involved in that. So we really appreciate that. Um, it did a lot with, with respect to his, um, his fight and how, how long he made it. Um, he was able to be a, a normal kid at times. So that was, that was really helpful and we really appreciate all that. Um, but while he was in the hospital in the very beginning, so he was five years old when he was diagnosed, um, he had told me in the hospital, he said, Mom, when I get to get out of here, and he was in there for about 150 days in the beginning, um, he said, when I get to get out of here, I want to come back and I want to bring toys to the kids um, that are in the hospital, because he loved when his papa came up and brought him a toy to kind of, you know, lift his spirits for the week or whatever. Um, so we looked into it and we started Trevor's Treasures immediately, a 501c3 organization. Um, he came up with the name and... Um, to this day, we still, um, at Thanksgiving, we bring food to the families. I spent many of Thanksgivings and Christmases in the hospital, and I, and I know what it's like. So at Thanksgiving and Christmas, we bring food to the families in the hospital. Um, Santa comes with us at Christmas, and they get to take pictures and everything. So we lost Trevor in 2013, but we carry this legacy on for him, so we're going on about our 12th year. Um, so we really appreciate you. Um, highlighting this and allowing us time to come out and talk with you guys. Um, you know, there are some of us in the schools and, you know, we know each other. We've battled together. Um, so we really appreciate it and, um, you know, thank you.
Okay, that will conclude citizens' time. Uh, we will move on to um, 1601 Board Matters presentation, the Office of Ombudsman, Revision Policy 180. Um, it's the first reading. Um, I think Ms. Espinosa is here, Thank our you. Ombudsman. Welcome, Ms. Espinosa. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz, and members of the school board for this opportunity to discuss the Office of the Ombudsman, and thank you also for the privilege to serve as the first Ombudsman at Prince William County Schools. By way of brief introduction, uh, my name is Sarah Miller Espinosa, and I am an attorney by training. My areas of expertise are labor and employment, as well as conflict resolution. Over the past six years, I've practiced exclusively as a workplace neutral, arbitrating, mediating, and establishing the Office of the Ombuds at Montgomery College, a multi-campus community college in Montgomery County, Maryland. I'd like to begin by sharing a very short video produced by the International Ombudsman Association that explains more about the role of the modern ombuds. Cue video. <laughs> For decades, organizational ombuds have provided confidential, neutral, informal, and independent guidance to people and organizations worldwide. In an era increasingly defined by conflict and accelerated change, ombuds have an important service to offer. Who are ombuds? They are trusted navigators, engaged by people and organizations to inform critical decisions for a lasting and positive impact. An ombud serves as a safe, off-the-record resource for employees, students, faculty, managers, executives, and citizens seeking ways to identify and address workplace issues and other concerns. They use their unique skill set to help people develop options for addressing these issues, separate from but often complementing the work of HR, legal, and compliance. Ombuds today understand that addressing a difficult issue is often the crucible through which individuals and organizations must pass before fairness, positive change, and progress can be achieved. The modern Ombuds empowers individuals to work through conflicts and concerns and helps organizations examine risks, strengthen culture, and address issues that stand in the way of achieving their goals. To that end, Ombuds facilitate a journey beyond the issue or conflict. Those they serve emerge transformed, empowered, and prepared to reach their full potential. For any organization in need of a trusted resource to help navigate today's complex social and work environments, the modern Ombuds is a transformative force toward more ethical, engaged, fair, and empowered organizations and communities around the world. To find out more about the value of the modern ombuds, please visit us at www.ombudsassociation.org. Prince William County Schools is in the forefront in establishing a K through 12 organizational ombuds program. These programs are prevalent in higher education and more commonly found also in corporate, the corporate sector and government, uh, particularly the federal sector. I believe that less than 40 programs nationwide uh, have K through 12 programs. The ombuds programs have the potential uh, to have an incredible impact within a s division. As you know, Board Policy 180 and best practices make clear that the Office of the Ombuds operate in accordance with the core values of confidentiality, impartiality, informality, and independence. These values will be explained in more depth in a moment. There are two co-equal co important responsibilities of the Office of the Ombuds. The first is to assist individuals seeking assistance by listening, identifying and analyzing options, empowering visitors, that's what we ombuds call the people who come to seek assistance, visitors, uh, empowering those visitors to choose which option they would like to pursue and where applicable facilitating informal discussions and resolution. The second important responsibility for the Office of the Ombuds is to collect data and identify trends and patterns while safeguarding the anonymity, anonymity of those seeking assistance. 
this data will be utilized to make quarterly and annual reports to the superintendent and to the board. Now I'd like to uh, cue video, please. Hello, I'm Sarah Miller Espinosa and I'm the Ombudsman for the Prince William County Public Schools. The Office of the Ombudsman was established by the school board as a resource for parents, students, and members of the school community to voluntarily seek confidential assistance in resolving school-related concerns, conflicts, and issues. If you have a school-related issue or concern, please consider contacting the Office of the Ombudsman. We will listen and help clarify your concerns, provide information, explore options available to help resolve the issues, and empower you to decide what option you wish to pursue. You can expect us to operate in accordance with the code of ethics and the core values of confidentiality, impartiality, informality, and independence. The Office of the Ombudsman will hold all communications confidential, not revealing to anyone that you contacted us without your explicit permission to do so. The exceptions to confidentiality are where there is a risk of harm. The Office of the Ombudsman is an impartial and neutral resource and does not take sides or advocate for a particular person or position. Rather, we focus on assisting with the facilitation of the resolution of issues and concerns. The Office of the Ombudsman does not take formal complaints, conduct investigations, or intervene in formal complaint procedures but will help you identify what informal options and formal processes are available to address your issues and concerns and how to access those processes. Finally, the Office of the Ombudsman is independent. The Office is not affiliated with any compliance function and does not serve as an agent of notice for the Prince William County Public Schools. The Ombudsman reports directly to the school board and superintendent and in addition to helping individuals, the Office of the Ombudsman collects data related to what types of issues and concerns are brought to the office, while protecting the anonymity of those seeking assistance. This information will be provided to the superintendent and the school board so that it may be used to help identify and address systemic issues and promote positive change. When you contact the Office of the Ombudsman for assistance, you can expect to be treated with respect and empowered with options to address your concerns. To make an appointment to speak in person or over the phone, please email ombuds, O-M-B-U-D-S, at pwcs.edu or call 703-791-8587. Thank you. There are two other items I just wanted to briefly mention. On first reading, you have tonight uh, proposed, proposed revisions to Policy 180. Uh, policy 180 uh, is almost entirely in line uh, with best practices. There are just some recommended clarifications in accordance uh, with best practice in the organizational ombuds community, including the explicit adoption of the IOA's code of ethics and authority to establish operational guidelines for the office. Additionally, I have uh, proposed three broad goals for fiscal year 2020 as the office of the ombudsman is established. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Jesse. Uh, thank you. I think my main concern, or not a concern really, is a question is how, how do we, what's the plan to make sure everyone knows of your availability? Because it sounds like a, you're a massive undertaking because you're talking about you know, parents and you're talking about teachers and everyone. What is the uh, plan to, to let principals, teachers, parents and everyone know that the availability of your service? Certainly, thank you. Well, first, uh, the, Office of the, uh, the Office of Communications has created a web page and put together the introductory video. I am going to level meetings. I'm meeting with um, as many groups as possible and as many advisory councils as possible. I'm asking them to invite me to more meetings. Um, and I am uh, seeking out 
opportunities to speak to groups of parents as well. Um, so I am going uh, everywhere that I am being invited, and I am inviting myself to as many groups <laughs> yeah, as I, I can I, find. That, that was my question. Are you, <laughs> are you going to be talking to teachers? Yes. In, in a regular, uh, okay, systematic way. Uh, I had some questions um, on slide seven. You say you do not conduct a, and does not conduct, conduct an investigation. Could you clarify that for me? What does that? Certainly. So I... Uh, in accordance with the International Ombudsman Association's Code of Ethics, the ombuds does not conduct any formal investigations. What I do do is if a visitor comes to see me uh, and has a concern, I do some information gathering to help determine what the options are for the visitor to resolve their concern. But I don't conduct formal investigations. Do you report back to the individual, or do you report? Who do you report to once you, that individual comes to you? What happens with that information? The individual. So I speak to the individual. The individual is my visitor, and the confidentiality um, exists between me and that visitor. So that visitor has the ability to uh, choose which option they believe is best for them. In addition to that, I collect data. So there are uniform reporting codes uh, that the IOA suggests that we ombuds use so that while that visitor may not choose to pursue a formal option in terms of addressing whatever the issue or concern is, I'll be collecting that data so that I can present, protecting the anonymity of the visitor, I can present uh, trends and patterns when I make the quarterly reports to the superintendent and the school board. Okay, I also read that um, there was, you, there, there was a, in one, I think it was in the code or perhaps it was in one of the policy statements, it says you unilaterally, that you, there may be instances where you unilaterally violate confidentiality. Could you ex expand on that a little bit for me? Certainly, where there's a serious risk of harm. Um, where I believe there's a serious risk of harm or where there's suspected child abuse or neglect, I will violate confidentiality, and I will tell my visitors that, and I tell my visitors that up front when they first come to see me. Oh, that was my question. Absolutely. Do you tell the, the person that you, you, know, you cannot proceed? Um, I think that those are the only questions I have. I may have a, an additional. I have some items written down, so I, I want to give the floor to other, other individuals. Thank you. Mr. Doit, or no, Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Espinoza. Um, I, uh, first off, I want to appreciate you taking the time to go through our policy and, and marking it up and everything. Actually, I think I'm happy that it's not a lot more red than what there was, considering we kind of wrote that on our own. Uh, Mary, did that, Mary did that, and she did a very good job, and of course, we all had our input onto it. To it. One thing I do want to just kind of want to ask you about is, um, and I know it's in compliance with, with the, uh, the, gu the guidance, is uh, the use of the term visitors. What's, when I first read that, I was looking at it going, that, that sounds like almost you're trying to, I don't know, it, it just, it, just a, a, it sounded like a softening of the term, and we want to, we want to make sure that we encourage our, 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 our school community, um, you know, students, parents, staff, teachers, um, anybody within the community to take, to take advantage of, of uh, your services if, if it's appropriate and they feel so. So I was just curious as to the reasoning behind the term visitor, I guess. I'm not sure why the ombuds community first adopted the term visitor. It, it is a, a rather odd term, um, but we didn't want, I believe, we didn't want to use a term like complainant um, because that may make people feel um, like they have to have uh, or they have to take some formal action if they came to see us. So the term visitor really is uh, just used within the ombuds community to describe those who are coming to seek assistance. Okay. Oh, actually, I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, one, one, of the, one of the concerns, like you said, about the confidentiality. So how are you going to go about maintaining uh, confidentiality for, like, meetings and stuff just because it's... Everybody sees people coming and going in this building and things like that. So how, how do you address those? Well, uh, very fortunately, uh, we have received office space in Building 50, um, which is a small modular unit behind Building 51 over on Joplin Road. So there is no security. 
<laughs> there is no check-in. Um, there aren't the same uh, beautiful glass windows all through the building as there are here. Um, so people will be able to come access the office. In addition to that, when people have concerns about coming um, to the office, I meet with people in libraries. I meet with people in coffee shops. So um, if someone has a concern about being seen coming to the office, we'll find a way to meet that concern. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to formally welcome you. I'm very excited to have you here in this position. Um, I'm a little biased with my uh, conflict resolution background and mediation background. I think this is a wonderful addition to our school system. Um, I like how you just clarified, uh, because I think it's really important that individuals know that they can meet you in your office or that you can come to them, because I think sometimes that's a roadblock if people think there's only one designated area. Um, I just want to ask you a quick question, uh, and that is, have you had visitors since you started on July 1? And um, maybe you could give us a little uh, synopsis on how you feel that the community, the school community, is perceiving you so far. Or so um, I started actually on August 5th, so I've been here a, a little more than a month, and I have had visitors. I had visitors who found me somehow um, in my first week, which was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, and thus far, I have found uh, the school community and the administration to be very welcoming. Um, you know, uh, my office space uh, that was found is excellent. Uh, the communication staff has been uh, wonderful in setting up all sorts of communications for me. Um, but also, uh, and foremost, uh, division council and the board clerk have been um, integral uh, in making sure that this office has what it needs in order to be successful. That's good to hear, and I ask that because part of your role is being able to have the community trust you. So it's good to know that we're already, as a school division, off on the right foot, and obviously some of those things are in place that you've already had visitors to seek you out. So that's wonderful to hear, and I know our communication staff has done a great job in promoting your office. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Well, I think uh, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you very much, um, and really excited to have you. I know, I think Gil has been talking about this position for a long time, and uh, so we're very excited this is a, a reality. Um, one, one more additional, or probably a couple more, but um, one more additional question. Um, in terms of protecting confidentiality, um, just so the public knows, um, what are we doing in terms of record keeping and maintaining those uh, in a confidential way mm -hmm. that people can trust? So um, our system for tracking data will be kept outside of uh, the school division servers. There's actually um, a, a program called Legal Edge that Division Council's office use that we're able to use with a, with a privacy wall so that Division Council won't see our information either. Awesome. Uh, and then can you walk through um what, what other um, kind of resources and team members your office has, and then maybe um, kind of what other things you've seen in other ombudsman offices for K-12 around this uh, country, have you started looking at it yet, that maybe we can be thinking long-term about, or maybe that's a topic for later, but. Um, certainly, well, I can also say uh, that I was very happily joined on Monday um, by an executive secre secretary in the office of the Ombudsman, uh, Rosa Maria Manzinas, who is wonderful and among her uh, many gifts is fluent in Spanish, so she will be of great help um, in uh, providing the best service to our visitors. Um, in addition to that, uh, I can tell you that in the state of Virginia, there is one other ombuds office that I know of right now, and that's in Fairfax. That office right now is exclusively focused on providing services to parents and families, and there is a, an administrative assistant, an ombudsman, and an assistant ombudsman for, for that role. So um, my hope is that in the future I'll be coming back, uh, or within the budget process, um, advocating uh, for, for an assistant ombuds as you see all of the visitors that are streaming into the office. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. 
Um, and in your code, is, I think it's labeled 3.8 on the communications. And it talks, it says, the communications made to the ombudsman are not noticed for to the organization. The ombudsman neither acts as an agent for, not, nor accepts notice on behalf of the organization and shall not serve in a position or a role. Could you explain what that means in layman's terms? Certainly. Um, so because all of the communications with the Office of the Ombudsman are confidential, and I'm not going to repeat them to anyone unless there is a risk, a serious risk of harm, um, and because this is an independent office, uh, if someone comes to see me uh, and alleges that um, they have some sort of tort or have been discriminated against by the division, that does not put the division on legal notice, and I tell people that. So if someone wants to put the division on legal notice, uh, they, need to, uh, they need to follow the processes that are established uh, within the policies and regulations, but coming to the office of the ombudsman uh, does not put the division on notice, and one of the reasons that we put that on all of our communications is to make sure that we protect the division from liability. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, you said it has, it does not, uh, it's not a part of the step in the grievance process. Could you explain that a little bit more? And then I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm not, the Office of the Ombudsman is not part of any formal complaint processes, including grievance processes. So um, if someone is going to file a grievance, that may be something that they discuss with me at the Office of the Ombuds as one of their options, but that's not part of the formal grievance process. Nobody has to come see me before they can file a grievance. Thank you very much. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to follow up on that last statement as far as not part of a formal grievance uh, process, which I appreciate. Um, one question I do have is, seems like sometimes we get uh, grievances that are filed and things like that in which we're, the individual filing them hasn't, they've missed steps in the process or something like that simply because they didn't understand the process. Is it part of, or is it part of your role to kind of explain that process to them so that they at least understand it and can make that education decision that way or? Yes, thank you. That is, that is one of the roles. So to provide information about the options and to explain, to walk people through the policies okay. and the procedure actually is the right term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to share Ms. Williams' enthusiasm. I want to I want to thank Ms. Williams, Mr. Trenum, every single member of this board who spent a lot of time um, looking over Policy 180, figuring this out, getting it right. I want to thank the administration, superintendent, division council, and uh, and our clerks too. Right, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we spent uh, a lot of time on this, and, and I'm very excited about the launch of this office, very excited about the marketing our communications folks are putting out there. This is, a, as Mr. Trenum put it, I think, uh, very well, a, a, a nice, or not nice, an alternative, um, a, a good option for our folks to come in and, and, and for all folks. And so I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm excited about your work. Please keep us informed about how it goes, and um, I think we'll wrap that up. Any other comments? Great. Thank we'll you. move on to, um, thank you, Ms. Espinosa. Have a good evening. Um, we'll go to 1701, proposed sale of VPSA bonds, fall 2019 sale, Walling, Mr. Wallingford. Um, this item is on for action. So we have Mr. Wallingford who is coming up to the podium to tell us about this exciting, you know, we, we did the first reading last week and uh, we'll be voting on the sale. Any, any, any comments, Mr. Wallingford, or any questions for Mr. Wallingford since this is the second reading? Mr. Deutsch? Uh, I'll make the motion. Sure. Uh, I move that the Prince William County School Board authorize completion and submission of the application of the VPSA for a fall 2019 standalone bond sale in the amount of 124 million 510,000 to finance certain capital improvement projects for school purposes, including the below list. Do you have a second? A Chairman. second. Uh, we'll take two seconds, Williams and Trenum, so we got a third there. Um, everybody. Everybody, Ms. Jesse. Everybody's second. Everyone's second, it's very exciting. Uh, let's, discussion? 
So I, 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 I get excited about these things. So, Mr. Wallingford, I'll just ask you just um, – just very quickly, in less than a minute, explain to me the process of how this works now. We will approve the authorization of $124 million in a um, sale of bonds. And, and how do we, how, just very quickly, how does that process work? So very you, don't, you don't go to New York and sit on the floor and get to do this, do you? That would be fun, but yeah. no. Uh, so good, uh, good evening, Dr. Latif, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. A uh, very short response, uh, good question. The uh, VPSA Board of Directors, they will actually be approving this uh, bond sale this VPSA week. is Virginia? The Virginia Public Oops. School Authority, thank Got you. Got it. Um, their board will be approving our sale this week after, after this resolution is adopted. Um, it then goes to sale on October 15th, and then we clo we'll close the issue approximately October 29th at which point we'll have access to those funds. They'll be placed in a trustee's account, and we'll draw from those funds as we expend on, on projects. Excellent. Well, uh, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, I've been notified that I need to uh, complete the motion. Oh. So um, I'm just going to finish reading the motion for the record, but we're making the motion that's listed here. Um, B, authorized superintendent or such other officer as he may designate to submit such documentation as required by VPSA. C, request for the Board of County Supervisors to authorize completion for a fall 2019 VPSA standalone bond sale and to take such other actions may be necessary to complete the bond sale. And D, direct this resolution shall become effective immediately. Now do I have a second for the amended motion? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. I second. Excellent. All right, any further discussion? Please vote. Vote is seven yes, one not present at vote. Jesse, motion passed. Excellent, thank you. Uh, moving on to superintendent's time, Dr. Waltz. Good evening. I'd like to begin with sharing some outstanding news about Kyle Wilson Elementary School, which has been named a 2019 Microsoft Showcase School. Kyle Wilson. Kyle Wilson Elementary School is the only school in the state of Virginia and one of only 40 in the United States and one of only 366 in the world to earn that distinction. Microsoft Showcase schools implement innovative practices into their leadership, teaching, and learning. They push the boundaries of innovation and strive to set new benchmarks for what is possible. Congratulations to Kyle Wilson Elementary School. Tanisha Holland, Equity and Compliance Officer for PWCS, was appointed Chair of the American Association of School Personnel Administrators Minority Caucus Committee. The purpose of the committee is to serve as a collaborating body for joint action on minority issues common of interest by advocating for the election, appointment, hiring, promotion, and recognition of minorities to positions of influence. We are very excited that PWCS is providing leadership for this important committee. Governor Ralph Northam appointed Maria Burgos, Supervisor of Global Learning and Culturally Responsive Instruction, to the Commission on African American History Education. The commission is charged with reviewing Virginia's history standards and the instructional practices, content, and resources currently used to teach African American history in the Commonwealth. Congratulations, Maria. The United States, or I'm sorry, the Unified Sports Program at Forest Park High School has earned two awards. First, ESPN has recognized Forest Park as one of the top 34 unified sports programs in the nation and number one in Virginia. Additionally, Special Olympics International has declared Forest Park High School a unified champion school and will present the school with an official banner on October 4th. Congratulations to Forest Park High School for recognition of their inclusionary practices with our student athletes. I had a great time last Friday at Bennett Elementary for International Dot Day, which is based on Peter Reynolds' classic book, The Dot, which challenges us 
to make our mark to see where it takes us. Mr. Eriks and I were dotted by the entire kindergarten class prior to reading the dot. We also experienced dot-inspired artwork, a science lesson on cells, and many other things on that visit. Thanks to the principal for the invitation. On Monday night, I enjoyed the Hilton High School varsity girls volleyball game versus Osborne High School from Manassas City Schools, and Hilton was the prevailing champion of that game. I want to conclude my remarks tonight highlighting a very special event that took place on September 11th, commonly known as 9-11. I had the honor of attending the Patriot High School Hero Day celebration under the direction of Chef Stevenson, our culinary students served a delicious breakfast to our first responders. The event also featured award-winning speaker and student Zori Jones, the Patriot Singers, and the marching band. Brooke Bell's employee program students also made t-shirts on the spot for our first responders. We attracted some great media coverage with Channel 7, DC being there, and follow-up stories by the Bristow Beat and the Bull Run Observer. Congratulations to Principal Bishop, Chef Stevenson, and the staff and students who participated. It was an excellent tribute to our first responders. Check out this video and please roll the video for a few more highlights. Thank you. being at Patriot High School on Hero Celebration Day, September 11th. I'm so impressed by what the students did for our first responders from this region. They invited them all in for a magnificent culinary breakfast. Today was an awesome day here in our classroom. We celebrated our Hero Day celebration. It's every year on September 11th, and we like to feed our first responders in the area fire, police, and we like to give back every year because they're the ones that come in when we need them, when we're scared, they're strong. So what better way to give back if you're a culinary student and a culinary teacher than to feed them some awesome breakfast. It was an amazing morning of appreciation and thanks, celebration and remembrance of September 11th. Okay, thank you, Dr. Waltz. All right, uh, we'll move on to Board Matters, 1901, uh, the adoption of new policy 139. Uh, Ms. McGowan, you wanna give us some background on that? Would you like me to go down to the podium or shall I do it from here? Oh, well, you could do it from there. Right. I'll be happy to. What we have in front of us tonight is another version of the um, proposed policy 139 with some edits made by Ms. Satterwhite, which are highlighted in yellow. I'm gonna just touch over on what those edits are. Um, the policy has been further limited to only allow electronic participation, remote participation, for regular school board meetings. It eliminates the right to participate at closed meetings or committee meetings. Um, it has been further na narrowed to eliminate the, um, the provision that allows for remote participation for personal reasons. So now the only um, reason for remote participation by electronic means is where there is a temporary or permanent physical disability or a medical condition. And that is limited to use two times a year. Um, then there is our further edits that Ms. Satterwhite suggested that um, addressed remote participation to the extent that the person is participating remotely, he or she needs to be in a location where other people are not present. Um, there's clarification here that the member participating remotely will be recognized by the chairman or vice chairman and the same member that the board members who are physically assembled at the meeting room are recognized. Um, and also that the um, that meetings where one participant, one or more participants are involved uh, remotely that to clarify that the meeting must be chaired by a board member who is physically present with the quorum at the actual location. In other words, 
the chairman could not be participating remotely and, and running the meeting. Um, and uh, the, it also clarified that notice of the uh, request to participate remotely must be given to the chairman or the vice chairman in the chairman's absence no later than noon on the day of the meeting in order to give the chairman time to notify all of the other school board members. So though that in a nutshell are the um, additions made by Ms. Satterwhite. So that was a first reading with Ms. Satterwhite's edits. Um, and you know, as we talked about this last week, we want to get this right if we're going to adopt this type of policy. So I would encourage um, everyone to look it over again, um, see if there's any things we missed, any things we want to add, delete, and then I think we bring it up in the next meeting or so for its um, for a vote. Ms. Williams. Um, I just want to make sure. So we do have opportunities to continue to edit this policy because um, uh, from Absolutely. my Absolutely. I apologize for being absent to last meeting, but um, it, uh, I think that this is a, a great idea. Um, and I know that we would not be the only other school division participating in this. Um, I think the idea behind it, at least from my perspective, is to try to make it as workable a policy for all of us um, as possible. So I'm excited to submit some um, additional edits for the next meeting. Excellent. And then since you weren't here, Ms. Uh, Williams, we did, we did mention and Ms. McGowan did some research and there are other school divisions with similar policies. So we're, our basis for the framework of this are, are, are coming from policies. Mr. Um, Trenum and then Mr. Mr. Trenum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ch Chairman. Actually, just one question, well, actually one comment and one question. Uh, as far as comments, I, I agree. I think it's uh, important that we get it right. But it's also, I think, important that we, that we don't, this is one of those instances where if we need to take several steps to get to something, try something, see how it works, then expand it later on down the road, that, that I think would be appropriate as well for something like this, because this is a little bit different for folks. The other question, I, and the question I have is, would it be possible for, for those other school divisions that have this, could we get copies of their policies, or did you send that and I just miss it? I was, I was gonna correct that. There are just a couple, I believe, in the state using the remote participation. The majority of places we benchmarked were um, county uh, county governments and city councils that are using the remote participation. And sure. I have some copies. I'll be happy to send them to you. That'd be great. Thank uh, you. I'll go to Ms. Williams and Ms. Ralston. Yeah, sorry about that. I meant to finish, but um, by saying that, you know, I participate on a few other boards and then uh, also for my other position, um, you know, the board there meets electronically most of the time. So I think this is great. We have a history in this school division of leading the way. Um, and I think this is another opportunity to do that, especially since now we live in an electronic world. Um, and this provides opportunity in case we don't have to cancel for snowstorms or someone gets trapped or something of that nature. Um, but I think it's another great opportunity for us to lead uh, the state in, in doing something very progressive. And it might also be a great way to continue to make our meetings more efficient as well. Ms. Ralston. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mary. Are there how many other schools did you say school divisions had this process? Uh, over the summer, I had our law clerk do a, um, some benchmarking, mm -hmm. and I have to go back and check exactly. I, there are, I think, just a few, very few. But here's the thing to remember: for those public bodies that have adopted this, 95 to 98 percent of their policies are verbatim taken from the statute, as was our draft. So what, when, when, we, when I share those with you, you're just going to see one or two sentence changes to, to what you have in front of you. The major area where people have made some tweaks is the approval process, because that's the only piece of the policy that's not spelled out by the FOIA statute. Mm -hmm. Mr. Do you. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think this policy... Um, is better, I'm still very, I don't know, this is gonna be an interesting idea. Uh, one question, I think the last draft we had allowed for remote participation in uh, work sessions. Does this still have that somewhere? I'm not seeing it, but I might be missing it. it. It's, it's also attached. There are two attachments. One is the one that was up for first reading the last time that incorporated some changes that you'd provided, Mr. Deutsch. Okay, but the, so the work session one didn't carry through to this set of amendments, is that correct? The, the work session one. 
the work session provision in terms of. I think he's protection. asking for does this electronic policy apply to work sessions or just board meetings? Is that correct, Mr. Deutsch? Yeah, and is that in the Satterway draft or just the last draft? It was in the first draft, I believe. Okay. But, well, but I think if we do pass something, I think that's very important. Um, I, I would also, um, I'm open to the noon or four notice time. I, either one's fine, I guess. Um, I, I think you can make a case either way. Um, I, I think we do need to have, it, it wouldn't be in policy, but I think we still need some kind of staff presentation or a memo just on procedurally what this is going to look like. Um, you know, because if we pass this, unlike some policies where it may take a little while to be implemented, theoretically somebody could be using it the next meeting after we pass it. Uh, and so we've got to know what that looks like before we pass it. So how do you, how do you actually join up to a meeting um, electronically? How is that person recognized in the meeting? Um, you know, all those types of things. And those aren't things you would spell out in a policy, but we just need an understanding as a board for what those mechanisms are going to be. So um, if we could have a, a staff presentation, we could kind of walk through and understand from the tech side before we pass it, I'd be a lot more comfortable. Um, I do think as we work through this, we've got to understand that we're, we're a public body, and so we should be very careful um, not to be in public when we're making our decisions. Um, this shouldn't be something we're, I don't know, it's hard to get particularly excited about this policy. Um, and there are going to be differences between, there's boards I'm on where, yeah, we have, we have meetings electronically, and that's fine, but we're not a public body. Uh, and so I think we've got to keep, keep that in mind as we work through this. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. Just to reiterate what Ms. McGowan had said, this policy would be based on statutory law that applies to public bodies. So we aren't creating anything new here, just adopting something that's currently in statute. But again, as Mr. Trenum nicely points out, Ms. Williams, we have time to work on this. This doesn't have to be voted on at the next meeting. This is something we can continue to sort of uh, mold and, and address and allow it to evolve as we continue to get this right. We want to make sure everyone has some say. Great. Ms. Jesse. Uh, I just have one comment about the time. You know, part of me says 4 o'clock, um, can all the technical support systems be in place that quickly? And then there's a 12 o'clock consideration. And then if, if there's an emergency, I don't know if you have a timeline on something like that. You can't say I can't have an emergency after 12 o'clock. So I think there are a lot of things that we really do need to look at. And I, I want to congratulate those uh, Lori Williams and uh, those persons who brought this uh, to the floor. I think it there are times when there is something on the floor that a, a board member really wants to vote on but has obligations that that are personal and or medically um, uh, cause that he or she cannot be present. So I think it does give us an opportunity and I'm glad that we're gonna take some time with it. Thank you and thank you very much. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. McGowan, thank you for putting together um, my corrections and making it look nice and neat. So. The reason I took out the the personal exemption and just left it medical, my thought, similar to what Mr. Um, Trenum said, my thought was I want to see something a little bit more concise as we get started, and then if we decide to add to it later on, we can because we make policy, right? I, I thought it was rather unwieldy with how much was in there, and so that was my thought between uh, making it just medical. Um, as for the time, I mean, that's something we can debate. Four o'clock, I was thinking, well, lots of us are in transit trying to get here or stuck in traffic at around four o'clock or rushing out the door. So for chairman or vice chairman to have to stop, make all those phone calls for the contacts to get everything going at four o'clock is just not very logistically um, reasonable. So that's why I added the time. And then, um, you know, Ms. McGowan and I discussed the remote participation allowed only when the members on the location when not other persons are present. And I think we talked about that a little bit, the security issues of our vote, making sure it is the board member who's voting. But I have, I have very strong opinions on the personal reasons. 
I know that sometimes people are gone for business and other things like that, but we do know well in advance when our meetings are going to be. And so that's something we can work to accommodate. And Ms. Williams, I do understand your comment about how we are moving more toward everything electronically, but one thing that happens in this room that you can't get electronically is seeing who's out here and hearing, really looking at the um, people who are speaking in citizen comment time. There's that connection with people who come in here to speak to us and our presenters who come in and speak to us. You don't have the same effect when you're looking at a flat screen. You don't have the full interaction with board members. And I think that's important because, I mean, looking, when we're really debating something, we get a good feel for how strongly people feel about something, for example, because we're here. We can see each other. And electronically, Yes, there'll be a camera, but there's things that you just can't pick up unless you're in the room. So that's one of my concerns with that also. Um, Mr. Trenum and I were discussing a few minutes ago the remote participation during a state of emergency. It does specify when the governor has declared a state of emergency as far as weather or other types of issues. We might want to consider adding something for inclement weather if we can't get together. Oh, we can't? Okay, never mind. No, Scratch we, that. We can't do that. <laughs> All right, I stand corrected. Um, but anyway, I, I'd like us to see us start with something a little bit more simple as we try and work it out. I do like Mr. Deutsch's idea about having a presentation on how this will work logistically before we pass it. It was a valid point. We could be using it right away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Ms. Williams. Um, I think you bring up a good point, Allison. I'd like to know from our IT staff about how long it would take for you to um, set up or if we're going to have a setup permanently uh, in place so that we can get a better idea of how much time maybe the chairman or the vice chairman would need. I wouldn't think um, the contacting other board members would be as much of an issue with today's technology. Everyone has a phone. But I want to make sure that our IT people have enough time on their side if based upon whether or not we're going to have something in place that's ongoing with every meeting or if it's going to be um, a setup as needed so that we can be sure that we're getting a good policy in place right off the bat. Um, and I, and I d I'm thankful that we do have a state code to follow. I think it's always good to start as close as possible to that and, and there are usually already pretty restrictive. Um, Mr. Chenum. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. One more follow up. Um, I'm usually all for dropping no notice bombs on our staff. It can be quite entertaining watching them react and things like that. But what we can do is that we could, we, we could also pass this with an implement da implementation date of some time in the future just to give our staff some time to work with and stuff like that because I do realize that there's work behind that. Yeah. So we, can, we, we don't have to pass something and then have them re re respond immediately like that. So we, can, we could incorporate that too. And again, there's no arbitrary deadline here. This is something that we're going to continue to talk about. Work on. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you. Um, I guess just in, in this discussion as well, I guess I still don't understand what we're trying to solve and what the need is for this policy. Um, and I guess that's why there's kind of a level of skepticism behind, you know, I, I hope whatever we pass is worked out, but I don't know why we need to pass anything. I mean, I think if we're going to be voting, we should be here at the board meetings um, in general, unless I, I still haven't seen that case laid out for why we need to shake up what we're doing. Um, and I think there should be a heavy push towards being here at board meetings. But anyway. So I'll wrap up this debate with saying what I said the last time. We have an outstanding attendance record by all members. And this would be something that would be used sort of, you know, as an emergent basis, which is why we're sticking to statute. But again, email, discuss this. We have time. Uh, we'll see this at the next meeting or pushed off further. We're going to move on to 19 without objection. We'll move on to 19 2 We're on our second thing in our board matters with Ms. Rita Goss, first reading. Take Good it. evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. Uh, tonight we are proposing an update to the language and policy 643, interscholastic activities. Uh, the revisions to the policy support uh, the practice of allowing VHSL eligibility exemptions for some transfers between schools, such as specialty program transfers and administrative transfers of students. Any questions? Well, Ms. Jesse. Could you just restate that again? Um, this change by removing that language, which said that the school board 
um, would not recognize the exemptions allowed by VHSL. Um, by taking that out, um, we are aligning ourselves to the practices of allowing um, those exemptions to be looked at and allowed for, um, for specialty programs or the administrative transfer of students, um, which is part of our transfer regulation to administratively transfer students to um, ensure their safety or well-being. Um, it could also Im intersect with um, our remedial measures for Title IX in which we may move a student um, or transfer a student to another school. So this allows um, continued access if that is deemed appropriate. Um, all of these um, cases are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um, the request I, I, I guess I'm, I, I may be confused on this because I'm just thinking about uh, a family that moves, does this apply to athletic students who are in athletics and their parents move or they transfer to another building? Does that affect their ability to, to be active in the athletic arena once they move? So, so it, it, it can, um, but um, typically moves um, when they happen, um, the eligibility uh, remains in place, but it really just depends. Again, it's hard to kind of say yes or no because each case is different. Um, the timing of a student's move or why a student is moving, um, all of those pieces um, come into play. Yeah, uh, there, there's been quite a bit of discussion about this, and so uh, I, I would like to have a conversation with you maybe later on about this. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you. All right, just so we understand, is this providing us greater flexibility? Yes. Awesome. Okay, no other questions. Thank you, Ms. Goss. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna take another break. 1903, Mr. Wallingford, policy 471, career Dr. service. Dr. Latif, members of the board, and Dr. Waltz. Um, uh, this is first reading for uh, new policy 471. And the purpose for putting this policy in place is what I referred to as orphaned regulations. We try to have a regula we have to try to have a policy for every regulation that we have in place. The courier service regulation did not have a policy. And so that's what this is being presented to you for this evening. Very simple. Okay, any thoughts, concerns? Oh, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this policy probably makes sense. It looks good. Um, I just think we need to keep the cart behind the horse and we should only be creating regulations if there's a policy, not policies after the fact for regulations. But anyway. Ms. Ms. Jesse. Uh, you, there's a strike through on number five you're referring to the regulation, Ms. Jesse? Uh, make special runs when needed to deliver or pick up school board materials. Sure. What's the rationale for removal of that? Um, it's, a, it's a redundancy. It's, it's, it's not intended to imply that we will not do that. It's already covered. I, I just in, need to know that. Sure. No, I understand. It's a fair question. Um, so like I said, it's, it's a redundancy. We're just removing it. We will still perform that function. Okay, I just want to know, and I, and I think I can be paid for my trip. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Wallingford. Thank you. We will move on to, without any opposition, we'll move on to 1904. Um, Ms. Hebner. Good evening, Chairman Latif, members of the school board, Dr. Waltz. Tonight I'm bringing forward policy 687, homebound and home-based instruction. Policy 687 has been updated to maintain compliance with VDOE and IDEA requirements. Language was included to outline the homebound services that address educational needs of children who are confined to their homes due to illness, injury, pregnancy, or emotional difficulty. Language was removed about the inclusion of students receiving homebound instruction as part of the disciplinary process, for example, students who are awaiting expulsion. Additionally, language is included to outline home-based instruction that refers to services that are delivered in the home setting or other settings in accordance with the student's individualized education plan. And this is in line with Regulation 687-2. Nope. Uh, Mr. Um, Trenum. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, this isn't actually a question about this specific policy, so I don't have anything with that policy. Just, a, just kind of an observation. Is so the the original policy was adopted in 1974. And it was last revised in 1993. So 03, 13. So that's like 26 years ago. So this is one of those that we were kind of behind on. So obviously we're going through our policies and catching up. Do we have a listing of, just a listing of the policies and when they were last reviewed and kind of a like status like that, just so we can kind of know where we are on some of that stuff? Dr. Waltz. We can get that to you. Thank you. <laughs> Gil, Gil's trying to wrap up everything before he's off the board. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, any more further questions, Mr. Deutsch? Uh, to piggyback back off of Mr. Trenum's point, someday the board could actually digitize all of our policies instead of having them on these PDFs, and we could actually sort through them much easier. We could actually probably search that answer in a key search or two. That would be sweet, but that's obviously not for today. Um, I actually, since we're getting nerdy on these, um, on the justification form. Uh, the third signature states that the new policy revisions of the current policy are substantive and must come to the school board for review and approval. I'm curious, if we have a not so substantive change for the policy, can it still go into effect without the school board voting on it? Yes, under the policy for policies. It says that if it's reviewed by me and I, and I just see an editorial change, meaning a changing a name of a title, or the name of a, a person's title, or a date, or a legal reference. Those type it's of election. mundane, non-substantive things just are made without coming to the board. That's what, that's what our policy on policy says. As long as we're sticking to those kind of changes, okay, fine. Ms. Williams. Um, I just, if memory serves me correctly, I think we do get updates on what set of policies that we are reviewing or when they're coming up for review, because I think it's about every 10 years we go back and look. I remember Mr. Eman in his former position stating that several times. And then I do know all of our policies and regulations are actually on the Prince William County School website. You can look it up by topic or policy number, um, and it contains all the same information. I'm not sure how else we would digitize it, but it is there if anybody um, wants to check it out. I look at it frequently for various reasons, because I'm a nerd. But anyway, it's there. Um, and I know that usually we get that update on what policies we are somewhere around budget season, around that time frame in the winter. I don't know if Mr. Guilfoy is going to continue with that tradition. Um, but I, I know it was about every 10 years, in case anybody missed that. It's excellent bedtime reading for your child. Yeah, right, Ms. Williams? Right yeah. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. Without opposition, we will move on. Thank you, Ms. Hebner. Excellent presentation. Outstanding. I think I'm up again. Um, oh, are you, are you still up here? So good. We'll go to 763 School Social Work Comprehensive Child Study Services. First reading. Okay. This policy is being brought forward um, as first reading and has been renamed. It's removing the comprehensive child study aspect as that now falls under the Office of Special Education. And this particular policy is speaking specifically to the work of social workers in the school setting. <clears throat> So it communicates the role of school-based social workers and their focus on mental health. It clearly outlines the areas in which they provide related services, such as IDEA, and to include their role in linking schools with, and parents and students with resources. It also reflects our social workers' efforts in supporting mental health, learning differences, and other factors that impact students' availability to learn, such as cultural factors, family, community, and trauma. Um, several aspects of the regulation were updated as they're no longer relevant, but um, we continue to work on impacting and addressing bullying and other programs to support our students through our social workers. Any specific questions with that? Getting a thumbs up for Mr. Wilk, that's a good sign. Mr. Thank you. Sorry, so just to be clear, under um, section two, all of the subsections we're striking are all policies and programs that are no longer in effect. Is that why we're striking them? So the impact program is, is no longer in existence. So yes, we're, we're updating that. And I guess like I, L, M, O are all getting struck. I'm sorry, are you on sorry, the policy I know or the regulation? Which, which strike there are you asking? I'm sorry, I can't. I'm so, uh, so section two. And we're striking uh, letters 
I, L, M, and O. I'm just confirming they're all programs that have already been, that we're no longer using. And that's why we're striking The these. impact program. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, you're in the regulation. And then you've got. Um, yes. All with bullying program, prevention program, healthy communities, healthy youth, and the world difference. We have the CCS social workers, multiple references there. So the policy, we're removing that from the policy because it's more appropriate in the regulation, and we use a, a broader overview of how we're addressing. We're still addressing those aspects, but we're not specifically naming OVAS as the only type of bullying prevention that we're using. We're broadening that so that we're able to provide professional development and allow flexibility in how we addro address the bullying and the different aspects of that. The impact program is no longer in place. Um, that's been replaced through education and health and PE and other aspects of our prevention specialists. Awesome. And the forms that are all under the attachments are all... No, wait. Where are those going to? Sorry, I'm in the read. Sorry, I'm in the regulation, so we're cutting a whole bunch of stuff from the regulation as well. Yes, you're, you are in the regulation, yeah. which is which is okay, and I'm going to maybe... Um, I'm so all the attachments in the regulation, were we offering those kind of forms still? Those are coming from our school-based counselors. From our, We're not including them in the regulation okay. at this time. The comprehensive child study form, if you're referring to that, comprehensive child study has been moved under special education. Mm -hmm. So that would be part of the intervention process. So it's not necessarily located in a regulation. It's under the special education intervention process. And people will be able to access these pretty easily? Yes, school-based personnel will have access to those. All right. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. All right. Um, we will move on to 1906 um, board times, dates, locations, um, school board meetings. This item is on for action. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Prince William County School Board, in accordance with policy 132, discuss and take action as needed regarding changes made to the school board meeting schedule for Tuesday, November 19th and Wednesday, December 18th. And as you all might recall, there was an email this summer that mentioned that, that sent the calendar out and two meetings were taken off, the Tuesday, November 19th and the Wednesday, December 18th, but yet we had not weighed in on that and had not voted on that. So. Um, yeah, I asked the chairman if he could please put this on the agenda so the school board could decide what we're going to do with those. Uh, sure, sure. Let, me, let me just get a second Absolutely. on your motion, then we'll do the discussion. I'll second. Do, okay, and now go ahead. Sorry, Allison. So that was second by Mr. Willie Deutsch of the Coles District. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, so Tuesday, November 19th is the Tuesday before we go to the Virginia School Board Association Conference. Traditionally, we've had that second meeting in November right before we go to VSBA. Wednesday, December 18th would be the second meeting in December. Now, last several years, we have only had one meeting in December, and usually it's been between when the first and second meeting would happen. Um, my hesitancy to cancel two meetings, especially when they fall well on the calendar, um, that's two meetings where citizens can't come and comment. And that's also, those are the, um, December 18th is the last meeting before we have um, CIP presentation. So. That's something to think about when we start talking about canceling meetings. And so it's up to the board. What are we going to do? Uh, we'll go Trenum and then Williams. Mr. Trenum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarification, is the motion that we reinstate those two meetings then? Yeah, they are cut. I mean, well, they, they, can't they, be get, cut without, they can't be cut without a vote, so they haven't been cut. So it's written, discuss, and take action as needed regarding the changes. So currently they are not on the calendar, but they have not been weighed in on by the school board. So, Can, so just for- I think for, I still have the floor, actually. Yeah, Mr. Trenum, go. So, um, so I guess, so from that perspective, the, the they, uh, they were not on the published calendar. However, they still exist in the motion that was voted on back in January. Correct. So, so, oh, okay. Um, 
So I, I, that's why I guess what's the, so are we just going to talk about it and then make another motion as to actually do something? Because a, a motion to discuss and take action, we still will need a motion to actually do something, whether it be cancel me. How, how about this? I would like to amend the motion, and I'll start just to start the discussion as a point of departure, is that we cancel the meeting for December, Wednesday, December 8th, like we have the last few years, but we leave the, leave the, me, the meeting on for Tuesday, November 19th, just as a point of starting the discussion so 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 let's go back one sec just to um, refresh everyone here so in the summer I sent an email out asking everybody if these meeting dates were fine I only got one response back from Lori Williams we had the first meeting of the year no one talked about it and so Miss Satterwhite's bringing it up now and I think it's all fair fair discussion points so Mr. Trenum, you are asking something different. Ms. Satterwhite's asking to add the meeting back in November and add a meeting in December. You're saying, let's just add the November meeting. So why don't we clarify a motion that we could vote up or down tonight? All right, but, but point of information, Mr. Chairman. We Mr. can't cancel a meeting by email. And so the January agenda, 12.06 um, for the January organizational meeting, stated we we're gonna have meetings on the first and third Wednesdays, um, and that adjustments will be made, but adjustments being made have always required a board vote. We've always had board votes in the last four years. So simply sending an email and not getting a response, the email should still mean we're, the chairman's going to initiate having a vote to actually cancel these meetings. So the first and third Wednesday meetings should still be on the agenda, and the motion should require us to vote to remove them, not to add them back on. So let me ask division council and um, so, and this may be very much my fault. Um, I was, you know, talking in the summer with, with the clerks and with division council that I guess traditionally we, we go over the meeting dates and, and put them out. And so if I have misinterpreted the fact that it was already voted on January, that should have already been um, uh, noticed I guess so did I make a mistake in that and if I did then I think Mr. Deutsch's point is correct and I'm not sure Ms. McGowan you can weigh in on that I, I think having consulted with the boards I think that past practices have not towed the line as Mr. Deutsch suggests so that changes to the changes to the uh, regular calendar the, every other Wednesday the two Wednesdays were were made by previous chairman after in the summertime, perhaps the clerk can address that a little better. But I agree that under the under the policies 131 and 132, the board once the board adopts a, a, a annual calendar, it can only be amended by vote of the board, and the policy says that. But I don't know whether you'd like an explanation from the clerk. Says no, that that's fine. I think at this point then. We are supposed to have those meetings. So if we're at that point where we're having those meetings, Mr. Trenum, would you like to revise your motion or would you just like to? Um, I will restate it. How about okay, that? how about that? So state a motion that you would like us to vote on. How about that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Prince William County School Board, in, a, in accordance with policy 132, Move, move the the second November meeting to Tuesday, November nineteenth, and cancel the Wednesday, December eighteenth meetings. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion on that, Miss Williams? Um, I I like. I mean, I'm all for meetings. What the, my response was, why would we not have these meetings? Because I couldn't remember off the top of my head when I first saw the email. Um, but since going back and looking at it, I think that we've become, as a board, very effective in our meetings and uh, getting things done. And traditionally, the meeting that we have before we go to VSB, um, yeah, it's VSB, VSBA, VSBA. Um, is the quickest, fastest, meeting we have of the year everyone's trying to get home and pack um, and since we do have leeway in our calendar maybe it would be um, better to table this discussion and allow for all of us to take a minute and think about it since we've all now sat here for a entire term um, and uh, maybe come back at our next meeting and uh, 
have some uh, better recollection of what we actually accomplished at those two meetings before making a decision. It's just a suggestion, but um, uh, you know, in previous years, it's it's a quick and dirty meeting. Is We're in and out. No, she's in, dis she's in discussion I'm on Gil's motion. She's asking if we could consider tabling this to, to finish the discussion next time. Mr. Trenum, any opposition to that? Um, I don't know that I have. I would like to hear some of the other board members' sure. thoughts on it, too, just that, for curiosity. And just to continue mine, I was really just making it a formal, a formal motion to basically continue the practice that we had over the last few years and just kind of bound it. Yeah, so the, the, four, the, the prior practice of the board was to, to not do the second December meeting and to do the me meeting the same week of the VSBA on Tuesday. And Ms. Williams pointing out that that's a short meeting. It I mean, is. I, we, don't, know, I, we, we spend most of our time just yeah. announcing we're about to go to VSBA. Sure. And, and you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I, this is my mistake on this, so I, I apologize. So I don't want to beat this thing to a dead horse. So I'm okay with voting on this tonight and moving forward. Um, uh, if we want to table it, I'm okay. Mr. Deutsch? Oh. Yeah, I guess just to the point earlier, I think once we have policies in place, we need to follow them. And I, maybe, maybe not, I feel like at one point we had kind of worked through this as a board and just included this when we first approved the meetings at the start of the year one time or something. But I might be misrecollecting that. Um, I like having meetings in general, um, but um, I, I would default towards that. Um, but anyway. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. Can I ask for clarification on his motion? Please. Yeah, the motion is to keep the December meet the November. So I'm going to do a hand vote on this. Okay. Well, so we're going to do. I have the motion. Okay. The motion. The clarification on the motion, uh, Mr. I, Trenum is. If I could read it. And sure. It, How about that? That's a great idea. Thank you that the Prince William County School Board in accordance with policy 132 moved to add the second meeting to Tuesday, November 19th, 2019 and cancel Wednesday, December 8th, the Wednesday, December 18th, 2019 school board meeting. Mr. Mr. Chairman, point of order. So this is a vote on whether to amend the main motion by Ms. Satterwhite and, that, and if that passes, then there is a, mo a vote on the substance of the amended motion. So we're voting on amending Ms. Satterwhite's motion right now? It's, yes, to amend. Okay. All right, please vote. All in favor? Okay, any opposition? Okay. Um, moving on to the second part of the motion, all in favor of the full motion now, which is the amended, oh good, we have it there, outstanding, vote yes, thank you. Uh, wait, is that, uh... Ms. Williams. Now, okay. What, All right. So we're not going to do a hand vote. There should be a motion up here f to reflect what the board just hand voted on, whether to amend the Ms. Satterwhite's motion, consistent with Mr. Mr. Trenum's suggestions. That passed unanimously. That should be reflected in the minutes. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to just in time's sake, I'm going to go a hand vote on this, and as, as I see no opposition. On the, oh, Ms. Williams. Sorry, I'm, I'm being a little nerdy. Um, do, do we need to add the second meeting if it's already still in existence? Because I, because if we're not changing meetings unless we take a vote, it's still technically there, right? We're taking it out. This vote's taking it out. So we're, we're already out. assuming it's still there. It out. This vote is taking out the second meeting. I think I can clarify that for Ms. Williams. The way it reads is normally it's the first and third Wednesdays, and we are adding the second one to the Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. just concerned Sorry. if we're doing all this and a wedding that it's redundant. Ms. McGowan, can I go ahead and take a hand vote? Or what are we doing? Yes, what? I'll work with the clerk to make sure the minutes reflect that. Outstanding. That would be great. So any opposition to the motion of the amended motion? Any opposition? What do you mean opposite? You're in favor of it. I support her amendment, but I don't support canceling meetings. 
vote? Okay, so yeah, it's one no on Deutsch. Everyone else is in favor of Mr. Trenum's motion. He voted for the amendment. Yeah. Okay. We're going on. That's passed. We, we have to move on. Um, we are moving on to... 1907, opposing development in the rural crescent, Deutsch and Satterwhite. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over the summer and heading into this year, there's been significant discussion about uh, development in rural crescent. Uh, in the uh, summer, there was a proposal from the Board of Supervisors that is still up for consideration that would add um, nearly 7,000 students require almost $400 million added to our CIP to address. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, significant drain on our ability to uh, address um, both helping older schools, getting ahead of our trailer issue, uh, and addressing class size overcrowding. Uh, and so in keeping with our past practice in pushing back on uh, development that overcrowds our schools, uh, this seemed to be a natural thing to continue to do. Uh, I understand there are continuing proposals coming out from staff on the Board of Supervisors, but uh, until there is a, a vote, um, it's important to continue to push back on uh, the overdevelopment um, that's being proposed and uh, make that point. So, I'm sorry, did we make a motion? No. Sure, I'll make the motion. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the attached resolution opposing uh, development in Earl Crescent. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, I'll second. Mr. Trenum seconds. Any discussion? Mr. Trenum or Mr. Deutsch discussed. We'll go to... Williams, and then we'll go down to the other side. Um, so this brings to mind, um, I think it was my first or second meeting on the board when the previous chairman had a, a resolution to discuss Medicare coming out of the General Assembly, um, and the board voted on it, and then we had to go back on our vote because it wasn't under our purview. Um, and we really didn't have the authority to make comments on that. And I hate to see the board go down that path again. Um, we very uh, efficiently and effectively state in our development impact statements that we send to the Board of County Supervisors our um, opposition or in favor of whatever the pending development is. And I think we've sat through plenty of uh, discussions with the legal teams to let us know that we don't have any authority whatsoever in development other than that impact statement. I think we spent all of last year refining that impact statement to make sure that it was worded as effectively as it could be um, when it comes to opposition of developments. Um, I just have a problem with this because we as a board don't like for the Board of County Supervisors to step their toes in our pool of water, and I think that this is a, a resolution that does the, that exact thing towards the Board of County Supervisors. Um, we do have systems in place uh, to state how we feel and when it comes to development, but we don't have taxing authority, we don't have approval authority or uh, disapproval authority when it comes to development. So I just hate for later on down the road for this to come and bite us in the tail or have to um, rescind a resolution as we've done in the past because we overstepped ourselves or we're meddling else in someone else's territory just because it is a current discussion. We all very much know that our school system is overcrowded. It's not only reported in, in the paper and the media, but we say that as often as we can um, in as many ways as allowable by law. Um, I just hate to see us get caught up in something that is a trend discussion when um, it really belongs in, in the Board of County Supervisors' authority. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate what you're saying, Ms. Williams. And actually, I, I agree that we've worked hard on those development impact statements. I'm not sure exactly uh, where the current state of the discussion is within the county, but I know that at one point the, the proposals from the, from the county staff were, would, would essentially make that by right rezonings, in which case our development impact statements have absolutely no impact because it's by right. So part of this, from my perspective, is to pro is to protect that, protect our ability to um, to, to influence that and, and for, to submit those development impact statements. Um, I I do appreciate the the staying in our swim swim lane aspect. Um, I think uh, there are times when those swim lanes 
do tend to overlap a little bit. I know that sometimes the Board of County Supervisors gets in our lanes a little bit, and we, we deal with that and work with that. But I think it's important also from a, just from a, a practical perspective, the, the, with the current proposals out there, that can mean thousands and thousands of houses, which means thousands and thousands of students, which means more schools and more funding and stuff like that. And we're still trying to catch up with uh, the Route 1 quarter and the eastern, uh, the schools on the eastern side. So trying, part of this, from my perspective, is getting this out, of, trying to get us out of that back and forth, back and forth that we've been fighting for the last 15 or 20 or, or longer years. So thank you. Uh, um, Ms. Satterwhite and then Ms. Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. So what was proposed in the previous, as was said, there's still some evolving thing ha things happening, but the rural cluster ribbon that was talked about by the Board of County Supervisors in the county's charts shows an increase of just under 7,000 students, and that's documented. Um, actually, 6,773 students were proposed in that transition ribbon. That's 6,773 students that we do not have in our current CIP. That's 6,773 6, students that we don't have accommodations for. This is one of, now it's one of the options that the Board of County Supervisors is looking at, but before the Planning Commission and the Board of County Supervisors decide on the rural plan, they're not going to send us a development impact statement about how many houses that they're going to be approving. We're not going to be asked to weigh in. We would only be weighing in once everything changed and then it could be chaos. So I'm, I'm just, I think it's wise for us to send a message to the Board of County Supervisors consistent with, as it spells out in the resolution, consistent with all the partnerships we are working on right now with the Board of County Supervisors in regards to property and reducing class size and reducing trailers and our own capital improvement plan. All of the statements here are based on fact. And then the last one is the resolution. I think we need to send the message that we are serious about getting out of trailers, we are serious about making sure we have room for our students, and let the Board of County Supervisors know that if they do open this up to development, like I said, those are students we don't have accommodations for, to accommodate those students in that kind of quantity is going to mean we're going to have to take away from our current plans, we're going to have to take away from schools we're already building, schools that we're working on that are older schools that we need to add to the infrastructure. All of that costs money, and a lot of those projects that we're already committing to, we don't have the money for as it is. So I'm just, I'm very concerned that if we get into um, a huge amount of development with the Royal Crescent, it's going to bust our CIP. And I don't want to see that happen. So I think you know, we aren't telling the Board of County Supervisors to do anything. I don't think we're stepping out of a, our bounds to just say we oppose this. I think it's smart as far as the money that we're spending as a school board to take care of our existing students. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. Um, when I re read the resolution, when you said everything is factual, I I'm, I'm afraid I don't agree that it's factual because when you say that significant collaborative steps have been taken by both boards to reduce trailers and class sizes and that the joint board has done this, uh, the joint board uh, during the time, I, there's still resistance to this whole uh, uh, plan to reduce trailers. There are members of that board who say things like, we have trailers in Arlington, why is not a problem for us? So the joint board, and uh, Ms. Williams can, she's on that board and she can correct it, but I don't think we've done anything uh, for to reduce trailers. Now, in my situation, we've reduced trailers in the Occoquan district from 28 to four, but we did that. There's, to me, it's, it's not a mystery of how to reduce trailers. You add more schools, we added a school, and we added three additions in Occoquan, and now we're down to four trailers. It's pretty simple, but there's nothing. Uh, Frank Principe came up with a plan, and I don't, Unless I missed it, I don't think we've voted to do anything drastically to produce. And I, I don't. I, I have a problem with that. We're talking about facts that um, I think when this becomes more of a reality, trying to get in front of it when we don't have all the facts, I just don't think this is something that the school board should take action on. Miss Williams. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to piggyback on on what Lily said to start, and that is the joint committee um, actually doesn't really have any authority to tell the boards to do anything. You only make recommendations, and it took mm -hmm. two years and a lot of pressing, uh, especially at the last meeting by myself, to actually take a vote mm -hmm. so that we could bring a recommendation back to both boards, which still has not, we haven't really finalized or done anything with that. And then in addition, um, I understand your, your rationing and your reasoning for wanting to um, have some sort of formal opposition, but like I said, we do do that. And it, to me, this is very narrow in its focus to just the rural crescent when our entire county is right now going through small area plans. And if there's any area in this county that's really impacted, it's mine because it is up for substantial development and, and being more and more urban. Um, if you look at the small area plan for Woodbridge, and I'm already drowning in my area with um, overcrowding and not per se so many students in a classroom, but not being able to fit them in the buildings that exist. Um, so I think if we're really going to make a statement, it should be where there, there is an urgent pressing need, which would be on the eastern end of the county, where the apartment buildings and all of these other things are going up at lightning speed. Um, but again, um, I recognize that. It's my district. I drive by it all the time. My son is in a school like that. Um, I've been battling the same thing with older facilities along with Miss Jessie now for several years. Um, I didn't put forth a resolution because I think and I believe in this committee that we founded. I believe in the new attitudes that we've had here as a board working collaboratively to, to refine what we can do that is within our authority. Um, and I think as a board, if we're going to recommend if we're going to make such a strong statement, it should be countywide and not such a small focus on one area because with the Royal Crescent, it still won't come close to the amount of children that will be populated in my area with the amount of apartment buildings and, and other developments that are already there. And this resolution also does not touch all of the developments that have already been approved that we need to be busy working and focusing on as they come on board um, to prepare for those students. So if we're going to say something as a board, I think we should say something as a board for all of our students and not just part of our student body. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess in response to Ms. Williams, I would say from, this, from, my, from my perspective, the, the resolution is specific and narrow because it's addressing a specific proposal that is coming before the Board of County Supervisors. As far as the small area plans, if, you want, if, we, want, if we want to work together and put, put together a resolution on a small area plan that's impacting your area, I'll be glad to vote for it. But, um, but this right now is based on some, a specific policy proposal that is coming before the Board of County Supervisors in the near future. That's from, so that's my explanation. Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's, been, there's been some discussion about our development impact statements. We pass development impact statements when there are um, changes that are going to be made uh, to zonings or for special use permits, et cetera, that end up impacting developments. Uh, if there are buildings and developments going up that don't require any zoning changes, don't require any SUP changes, those don't come before the Planning Commission or Supervisors ourselves. If these pass, they're going, if the significant changes that are being discussed, the Royal Crescent passes, there will be large changes to the zoning approved in that, that we will then not have any input on when the, uh, those developments end up happening because they will be by right. At that point, the approval will have already been given to operate within the new zoning parameters that are being discussed. So we're not going to have development impact statements coming up for those kind of items after the zoning's already in place and already addressed. So that's why this is A, in keeping with the language of our development impact statement, so it's keeping with the same policy proposal that we've offered, but it's our only time to act. To not act before there is a passage of some change to the Royal Crescent means we're not going to act. Uh, and so, you know, there are other significant developments uh, and changes to zoning on the table. We can bring those resolutions forward. Um, but to say that we shouldn't vote on um, one resolution in opposition because uh, other board members haven't brought forward others, we can, we can spit and chew gum at the same time, or walk and chew gum at the same time, whatever the phrase is. Sorry, my bad there. My bad there. Uh, but we can, we can bring forward another resolution next meeting. Uh, that's not an issue. Let's, let's go ahead and do that, and let's have that discussion. 
um, but to uh, significantly develop an area um, in a way that's going to mean we're not going to have impact later um, or input later, that's a problem. And so the time to act is now, um, or at least the time to act is before the Board of Supervisors changes up the zoning process for the Royal Crescent. Um, after that's changed, we're not going to be able to act. So we should take an action then if we're going to be consistent with um, our opposition uh, to overdevelopment that overcrowds our schools. Um, and also, if we want to stick with, I mean, we passed a vote last November um, where we were going to work collaboratively with the Board of Supervisors to reduce trailers. We've reduced significant number of trailers. You know, we can get better, um, but we're, we're taking actions on that front. Um, we took a number of actions in the last budget, likely in this next budget, to address older schools. Um, to have the money for that, we're going to need our um, student population to keep leveling off and not have a significant drain on our CIP. Uh, and so to continue going down the path of improving our schools that we're working towards uh, being on, uh, we need that financial flexibility. Um, but anyway, the time to act is now. If we don't act before there's a change of the Royal Crescent, we're not acting at all. Okay, I'll wrap up um, here. I, I will sort of weigh in on the sense that, um, as Ms. Williams initially stated, and as Mr. Treadham recognized it, uh, this is not our lane. Um, county school boards do not weigh in on land issues outside of our development impact statement. The County Board of Supervisors um, makes decisions on zoning and rezonings. We offer our development impact statements, which as Ms. Williams and Mr. Trenum point out, we spent a lot of time on. And our statements are extremely strong and are on a case-by-case -case basis. And they have continued to get stronger. This resolution provides no legal basis for the school board um, or offers no legal um, guidance um, for the County Board of Supervisors to recognize. Frankly, our development impact statements have more authority um, and they can choose to ignore it as they have and that's something that the people of the county have to decide as they go to the polls and elect folks what are you electing for so you know this is not within our our lane and i think you know as has also been pointed out we had a joint task force they spent two years on coming up with a trailer reduction plan that during budget season the supervisors had zero, and I'm telling you, they told me zero appetite to fund. Yeah. They gave us 20 million a couple years ago, which over the course of the two or three years of that spend rate was less than 1% of the total revenue share, mm -hmm. um, and, and doesn't do a whole lot. They did a few trailers. All the trailer reductions that we've done, the schools have done based on our bond, our, our debt, and our building. And that's how that has worked. And so, to say that we have worked with them, we've succeeded in spite of them. And I think that's more accurate. Um, I look forward to continuing that joint task force to see if the County Board of Supervisors has the appetite and the courage to address these long-term systemic problems that have been institutionalized in our school system for way too long. But I do not uh, support this resolution, in the same way I do not support a resolution that the County Board of Supervisors tells us how to educate the kids, where to put the schools, and what to do. I will also oppose this on the fact that, you know, we have put two schools in the Rural Crescent. As Mr. Trenum knows, the Patriot High School and T. Clay Wood are right smack dab in the Rural Crescent. And so I won't tie the hands of this school board or any further school boards um, of being able to address the needs of the school system wherever in this county, we need to have a school. So I will oppose this resolution. Um, and I think if we can move, uh, Mr. Deutsch, you've talked a couple times. I'll, I'll, we'll go ahead and do it one more time. All right. And you got very quickly, sir. That's fine, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, the argument that this is not our lane is simply an effort to dodge the vote. Uh, because on the one hand, there's the argument that this is not our lane. On the flip side, then, we immediately revert back to speeches about how the Board of Supervisors needs to raise taxes and give us more tax money. Um, the last six to nine months of the chairman race, we've heard the chairman repeatedly uh, go after and attack members of the Board of Supervisors. So there has to be a choice. What is the lane? Is it to work with or not? But repeatedly, um, the argument has been to go after and attack members of the Board of Supervisors for not giving us enough money, which arguably is an important thing that they do that also impacts us. 
zoning is an important thing that they do that impacts us as well. So to say that uh, this isn't our lane is to dodge the issue and avoid taking action for our school division. Please vote. The vote is three yes, five no, motion failed. We'll move on to board matters. Um, this time we'll start, and I think just for the public's notice, we will be going into closed session um, after board matters. So we'll start down with Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight we passed a motion acknowledging Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and I wanna thank um, the board for passing the motion. I wanna thank the families and staff members who came out tonight to support this resolution. We heard some powerful comments tonight, and I thank everyone for sharing and for joining with us. Um, this is back to school season, and we've been going to lots of back to school nights. Last night, I was at Parkside, and I took a walk around the school and learned, um, they have some gorgeous new furniture in their cafeteria. I learned something new every one I go to. I was at Bull Run Middle School and Ronald Reagan Middle School on Monday night. Great to see everybody at those back to school nights. Um, there was a little trip to Fred Lynn. I've been promising Mr. Brewer I'd come out and see him, and um, I love my earrings. Mm -hmm. It was fun to see your school, Ms. Williams. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's always a delight to see new places, and I learn something new every time. The after-school program at Fred Lynn is absolutely phenomenal. It was great to learn about that. Very excited about that. So um, we're gonna continue with the back to school nights. We have them through the first week of October and we'll keep busy going out and visiting everybody. And it's just, it's always going in and visiting a school. There's always something new to learn, whether it's our programming, something about our student activities, something about the school itself. It's an absolute delight. So I really enjoyed those visits. Um, I am disappointed in how the Royal Crescent vote went tonight. Um, the Royal Crescent is not just a small area. It covers from the very top of the county at the very next to the Loudoun County line all the way down to the Potomac District. So it's a large area of the county. I'm disappointed how it went. Um, you know, we can hope that the Board of County Supervisors does not support some of the motions that have been in front of, or some of the um, ideas that have been in front of them from the Planning Commission, because I would hate to see us have to fork over over half a million dollars for new schools because we have 7,000 students added. So 6,700 and some students. I'm very disappointed in that. I think it's short-sighted on the part of the board, but the vote happened. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Trenum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, first to correction, Ms. Uh, Saturday, I think you're talking about half a billion. Excuse me, yes. <laughs> half a billion. Yes, Mr. Trim, half a billion. Sorry. Okay, thank late. you. All right, uh, first off, a shout out to all our civics teachers. Yesterday was National Constitution Day. So um, it's our, it's more, it's, you know, our country's, uh, it's the way we, the found, foundational document for how we run our country. So. Thank you to all our civics teachers. I know you are underappreciated, uh, but you, you are truly loved, so thank you. Um, second thing is uh, I, I had the, uh, the pleasure of, uh, of going out to Stonewall Jackson High School last Friday evening for the football game and for the dedication of the new turf field. Dr. Waltz, it was a wonderful, thing, wonderful experience. The, the field is uh, beautiful. It is nice and soft and cushy to walk on. It was a pleasure. Um, and actually, uh, Dr. Nichols did a great thing. He invited uh, all the athletic alumni to come out and uh, walk the field with him. Uh, I don't know, he had I don't know, a couple hundred people plus or something like there. And uh, like a good principal, he's collecting email addresses and, and everything in the process. So, so that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But it was good. I, I would a like to ask more uh, facilities folks. Um, the field is beautiful, but if I could get an update as to when we think we're going to actually have the track portion finished, the, the rubberized coating and the painting and, th and the striping and things like that, that would be great. And the last thing I want to talk about is I, too, attended the um, Heroes Breakfast at, um, at Patriot High School on September the 11th. It, it was a wonderful experience. The kids did a great job um, and our staff. The, the food was good. Uh, the, the music was great, the entertainment by both the choir and the band. Um, Dr. Waltz mentioned the t-shirts, but he didn't do them justice, so I am going to do them justice. <laughs> the autism students, they make them. You can have your choice in police or fire. 
Go out and support the kids. Buy a shirt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trenum. <laughs> Ms. Rawls. Uh, we will go to Ms. Jesse. Turn my mic on. Um, I, uh, back to school nights, of course, uh, uh, we did middle school, so I went to Fred Lynn because a lot of my students from uh, Occoquan attend Fred Lynn and had a wonderful visit there. Also went to Lake Ridge Middle. There were people everywhere in that school. It's the most beautiful school I've ever seen. The new principal there is doing a phenomenal job. Uh, we had a picnic at Rockledge on Saturday, and uh, the parents in that school are very active and very, very involved. Um, on Friday, it was a Saturday, we, I went to the Athletic Hall of Fame at Woodbridge High School, and there were many stars there, but the two people I'd like to bring it to attention tonight was Deshaun Hand, and he, is, he was one of the football players there and a defensive player, and Sean had 90 scholarship offers, and I had no idea how famous this guy was. He uh, was picked up by Alabama, and he is now working, uh, playing for the Detroit, Lion Detroit Lions. And uh, he's had a couple of injuries, but he's going to be back on the field, he said, in fact, this week. Um, and he also wanted to, he thanked so many people at that school, but Mr. Washington, who's done a phenomenal job at that school, and Gary Wortham and his son, uh, Gary Wortham Jr., have done great things with scholarship offers for many of the kids, and uh, Mr. Han is one of those. And in the Hall of Fame, I have this photo, which you cannot see, but it is Mr. Tony Jones who is also secondary, um, our supervisor of secondary education, holds five, five distance run, distance, uh, he was a, a runner, uh, and also did the triple jump, long jump, and shuttle hurdle relays, and he was recognized that night. And while there, I asked Mr. Washington if I could see the weight room, and Dr. Waltz would be interested in this because remember we had that big wall? I think we have a photo. Do we have something? I have a, a slide of that new, the new facility. I think you'll love this. It's up there. There it is. It's beautiful. Uh, they were able to get all this new equipment for that room, and I could not believe the difference in that room. Of course, it's safer, but it is a phenomenal job. And I want to thank uh, facilities. Uh, who came, who met with parents who care to help with that whole process. And also, I want to thank you for this beautiful field. I think we have a, a picture of the field. Woodbridge High School now has a new turf field. And you know, I was, I wanted a different turf field, but this field is just beautiful. And the kids are very, very excited, and so are the coaches. So thank you for all that you do, and to facilities. I'd like for you to get back with the parents who care, and they had 31 items. Mr. Jesse, and I couldn't get a picture of this, but Mr. Jesse went to the men's bathroom, and I'm told we no longer have a trough. Is that the word? We now have urinals. So thank you very, very much. Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd uh, first like to start by apologizing for missing the first meeting of the year. I generally uh, try my hardest not to miss any, but um, as a parent, I was very excited to drop off my oldest at his freshman year of college. So that was really cool on my end. And um, I bring that up not only to apologize for missing the meeting, but to also say um, to all of our staff and teachers and everyone who makes it possible, I was proud to have a son who was fully prepared to enter his college career. And it was really refreshing to go down there because as a mom, you drill hard on, you know, you need to know this, you need to know that, you need to know this. And a lot of it, he really learned in school. Um, and uh, that was just, it just warmed my heart to know that we're doing a good job um, and to get that external validation for it because I, I, I know we're doing a good job, but to have someone uh, not involved in the school system, states away, um, go through I, line item by line item and, and I'm in my head checking him off going, oh, he already knows how to do that. He already knows how to do that. 
And um, I just wanted to give a special shout out to Chef Evans at Potomac for their culinary program because my son entered a culinary program. And I can honestly say uh, it is a world-class program. My son is very well prepared at Johnson & Wales, which is a very prestigious culinary school. And I had no hand in that other than taking him to back to, to the college fair and going, turn this application in right now. Um, so uh, it's just a really good feeling as a parent and it's a really good feeling as a board member to know how well we are doing with our students. Um, I also wanted to say uh, back to school night, again, like uh, Allison mentioned, uh, I've been to a few. I was very excited at Rip On Middle School's uh, back to school night because what I did not know is three of our valedictorians last year came through Rip On. Um, so it's just really interesting to see how our students progress and learn, but uh, that's quite a high uh, average there of valedictorians coming through Ripon over there, and they were not all specialty program members either. Um, so that was really cool. I'd like to thank the National Capital Area Committee of 100 Black Women, I think I'm saying that right. And if I'm not, I apologize. Um, but they have a new program, the RAP program at Ripon Middle School. It's their first year there. Future Kings is also there. And of course, Omega Sci-Fi, who's everywhere, but they are also there, um, as well as at Fred Lynn. Um, the, the number of after-school programs and outreach we have for our middle schoolers and what we continue to do for our students just grows every year. It makes me very, very proud. Um, I have missed Rip on Middle's initial back to school night, but I will be there again uh, for, it's coming up here later on in the week. I also want to say, I know I have 16 seconds, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to go over, but congratulations to Freedom High School. Last week they were ABC 7's uh, game of the week, and not only were they featured on the news, Dr. Wells was there, uh, but they successfully beat uh, the Eagles in Stafford. Uh, so that was a very cool moment for Freedom High School for those players. Um, it was awesome. Uh, Dr. Watts actually got a little dancing in. I don't know if the news caught that with the Soul Squad. Um, but I think it's just another way that we are able to highlight and encourage our student body in all of the wonderful programming that we have. And I'm just really proud to be a part of that. And then I also want to encourage this board as we participate, I'm going to wrap up to, um, it, to look forward to the future with things like Amazon and other things coming down the pike um, to focus on our our county as a whole and do our job as we best as we can to prepare for the future as we have our students and we expect more families and more students coming into all areas of our county. Um, I think we can do that because we, we have done a good job at working well together and I hope that we continue to do that in the future. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I actually have a little more time. Our last meeting? Sure. All right. Um, so just want to start off, uh, the Stonewall Jackson High School uh, was a very exciting time. Um, and I think just walking there with well over 100, maybe 200 alumni, and just hearing people come back and share their stories was just incredible. And the impact of that school community um, on so many people, uh, there is one guy who came back and he was like, I was the uh, captain of this football team, my quarterback's over there, and tell us about plays he made. Uh, decades ago, and just their ability to come back to be excited about that school. Um, they were celebrating the improvements they saw, remembering the successes, um, and it was just, it was a really positive, incredible time. Uh, and the school community really turned out that day as well. Uh, the uh, the homestands were, were packed out, so it was, it was a great time, um, and really excited. Also, Friday is um, Hilton's doing a uh, Hall of Fame time as well. Looking forward to that game and that celebration there. Well, they're, they're Friday and Saturday. Yeah. yeah, Friday and Saturday we're doing stuff. It should be, should be a lot of fun. Two days of partying at Hilton. A um, couple, couple of things. We're down. I guess we're down to our last four or five meetings of the school year. Um, five. There we go. Gil's counting them down very happily. Um, <laughs> stuck on five. There we go. A uh, couple, I, I think we've, I think I'd hopefully before we get to the next CIP, I would just, I think I've raised this before, but uh, maybe we can get an update and hopefully the numbers for the updated planning numbers for middle school and high school. Not sure where we're at on that, but I know we've been asking about those for a while. Uh, also, um, would definitely appreciate an update and possibly a public presentation on the um, CIP data audit, um, I we should have that soon. We had voted to approve that back in November. 
and we should have those updated numbers soon, and uh, we can hopefully share those with the public um, ASAP. Um, also on that front, we've been getting a lot of um, uh, emails from the community, et cetera, um, and I appreciate a, uh, a public briefing on the uh, environmental concerns around Jenkins Elementary. Uh, it's definitely something we've been getting, a bunch of emails. We've got involved uh, parents, community members who would love to uh, get an update there. Um, so I think that would be an appropriate thing to just walk through our processes, know what's going on there, and that would be helpful. Um, we've got five more meetings. Um, it's, it's an exciting time. If board members have things they want to take action on, uh, draft something up and offer it. Um, and I think we've had um, some people close to board members recommend that we take action on stuff. Let's see the proposals. Let's keep having fun for five more meetings and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing to kick off school year. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. Mr. Wilk. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you. No, it's good. Um, <laughs> we have a late night ahead of us. I uh, want to recognize a couple events that I went to this past two weeks. Last night I was at Swans Creek, had their PTA ice cream social. There were over 500 tickets sold. Over 700 people came in attendance in the greater Southbridge community. Uh, I want to thank Principal Whitley and her team uh, for a great event. They're doing an outstanding job at Swans Creek. Uh, it's a great school and I love visiting right down the road. Uh, I attended on Saturday, Patty, Patty Elementary had their first uh, community day. Uh, this was an outstanding event uh, with the greater Montclair community uh, who all attended this event. I want to thank Principal Lachiati and his team on the PTA for putting on this event, outstanding event. Uh, last week was also the back to, two, back to school nights for all of us for our middle schools. So I went to my two middle schools, both Graham Park I uh, want to recognize, again, the Omegas Committee of 100 Black Women, uh, the group, outstanding organizations and partnerships with the school. Uh, Maria Ramadan is doing an outstanding job. I was excited that the board put in an additional administrative position in a building like Grand Park. I've already heard from the principals and teachers that this is allowing them more time to be in the classrooms uh, and have an impact on the climate and culture of the building. So I want to thank Mr. Bigsby and the team for that. Uh, Potomac Middle School also was at their back to school night, excited about the progress of the aquaponics program. I believe this will be the first middle school program in the country. I'm looking forward. I think we're going to get it hopefully November, right, Mr. Bigsby? Kind of, yes. November, launch that. So that'll be a really cool program that I've been working on for the last three years with that team uh, there. And I also made some school visits uh, a couple weeks ago, went to Patty, and then, of course, Forest Park High School. I'm very excited about Forest Park um, and the work that Principal Martinez is doing. When I went there three years ago, I said, you know, we need to do better. You know, the IT program, we should have more digital cameras. We should have Macs in the, uh, the graphic design classes. We should do a lot of this stuff. And um, he has gone through, provided this. We've provided the funding and support, and he's done a great job enhancing these programs at uh, Forest Park. It was great to see this and actually have him take me around and show me this is what we did, this is what we did, and great progress in action. So very good stuff, um, and uh, thank you, everyone. Have a Well, we'll be here, but have a good night. Real quick, um, great rollout to the school year. We're settling in. A couple um, things to remember. If you're um, out of school, you're a parent, please join your PTO, PTA. Uh, very helpful. Uh, parents who stay engaged, students perform and do better. Um, so we'd love to have your support and continue to support, and thank you for all those who do participate in our PTO, and, and, um, and that's great. Um, Parent View is the new um, student information system, I guess you'd call it. Outstanding. It's allowing parents to be more engaged. I think technology acquisition is critical when you, large, when you run a large enterprise like our school division. I think it's important to um, uh, acquire good technology. I think it's important to roll it out well. And I think this Parent View has been outstanding. And I want to congratulate our, our IT team communications team, superintendent's office. This has done a really, it is fantastic. I have four kids and, um, and we're running them all on, on Parent View and the Hub. And so thank you very much. And so overall, I think it's been a great rollout to the beginning of the school year. Congratulations to the staff. We have now settling into the first quarter. And so for our seniors, please get um, um, you know, to meeting with your counselors to help you make your plans for the rest of the school year. And say that again. Yes, yes, and, uh, and then there are some college fairs up on the, um, the school board website for everyone to look at. So next we're going to move to, and this is going to be my first time doing this, so we're going to, I'll ask the clerks, clerks, do we have, uh, Ms. Debbie, do we have any citizen comments for 20.01?
No, sir. 21.01, we're going to go, we're going to move to the approval of a closed session agenda. I need a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? second. I second. Ralston, seconds. Uh, any discussion? Please vote. Do we have to? Vote is eight, yes, unanimous, motion passed. Next, we'll move to 2202. Um, I need a motion to enter closed session. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilk. I, again, uh, move uh, action that pursuant to Virginia sections 2.2-3711A1 uh, that the Prince William County School Board re-enter closed session for the purpose of discussing the performance and mutually agreed upon goals of our superintendent for the 1920 school year consistent with the Virginia Department of Education performance standards. Do you have a second? Mr. Ms. Chair. Williams. A second. Outstanding. Discussion? Please vote. Mm -hmm. Members take f five, five minutes um, break, drinks. Vote is eight, yes, unanimous. Motion passed. Thank you. Vote. 